rattling gray hair and even new service to shuttle your teens around. We have something for everyone. But first, many of us are looking for ways to live longer and feel healthier as we age. Could the answer be found in so-called longevity clinics? They're not cheap. To see what they're like, I checked into a longevity clinic right here in Manhattan. The aging process dead in its tracks. Unlike in the movie Death Becomes Her, drinking a magic potion won't make you live forever. I'm a girl. But that doesn't mean we aren't obsessed with living longer. Even celebrities like Maria Menounos promoting the health because benefits of full body I scans to, to Hoda on Today. That you have to be the CEO of your health. Longevity medicine is the business of helping people live healthier, longer lives. Last year, it topped $26 billion in the U.S. I'm here outside the Princeton Longevity Center in Manhattan to give you a look at what happens. But first, I had to fill out an extensive health questionnaire. Everything from my eating habits to my sleeping habits to my family's medical history. And we are here bright and early today because this whole experience is gonna take about eight hours. Welcome to Princeton Longevity Center. After check-in, I'm taken to my private lounge where I'll rest between medical exams and tests. Okay, I'm told the first thing we're doing this morning is getting my vital signs. They're gonna draw some blood. They're checking my hormone levels. They're gonna look at kidney and liver function. And they're doing it all this morning so that we can get the results by this afternoon. Pretty quick turnaround. I'm getting a bone density and body scan to measure my bone strength and muscle mass. Blood draws to screen for things like genetic cancer markers, cholesterol, and vitamin deficiencies. Oh, last one already? You're on the last one. Yay. A test of my resting metabolic rate to see how many calories I burn just by existing. So when I'm resting, my body's burning a, 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 a thousand calories. Uh, a thousand around a thousand calories. calories. And a standard physical. Ever been told you snore? No, I don't think I snore. Dr. David Fine founded the Princeton Longevity Center in 2001 to help people optimize their health with nutrition, exercise, and medical care with the hope of living longer and better. Who makes an ideal patient? Because for some people, knowing what's coming down the road can make them more anxious and more stressed. On the one hand, that's true. On the other hand, though, you have two choices. You can find out what's going on or it can find you. Where is the sweet spot where some things may resolve on their own versus I'm going in and doing so much intervention and some of it may not be necessary. Well, you know, certainly a lot of things do resolve on their own. What we're really looking for really are more of the things that are going to be the chronic diseases of getting older. Your risk of diabetes, your risk of heart attacks and strokes, your, your cancer risk, for example. My day continues with a CT scan of my heart and body. A few tests down, a few more to go. Nearly three and a half hours later. Breakfast at last. A quick bite and a cardiac stress test with a sports physiologist. This is definitely aptly named stress test. Then a vision and hearing test. Next up is the ultimate athlete stress test. I thought that walking thing was hard. I think this is going to be really rough. The price you have to pay if you want to be an athlete. <laughs> what if you're just a reporter? I'm hooked up to the same machine used by Olympic athletes to measure my oxygen output and heart health. You got it. You got it. The view from the top unbeatable but after 10 minutes with the speed and incline creeping up i'm beat ah i survived it barely i get my results quickly your act, heart is acting like a 28 year old but when i meet with the nutritionist who reviewed my food logs she tells me to beef up my protein intake out of all your calories only 15 percent is coming from protein how much so should be coming should be 30 to 40. oh wow yes then i get the verdict on my overall health on the whole you're actually in really good health dr fine says the scans did find the bone density in my hips is below normal and my body fat percentage was above average at 36 percent he recommended weight-bearing exercise and strength training. It's time to pump exactly. me up. Mm. Then an unexpected result. You had a small nodule okay. over here in your left lung. It's this little guy right there. Wow, okay. Dr. Fine says it's likely a harmless lymph node, but recommended I get scanned in a year to check for growth. We don't yet have a lot of data on the experiences of people who are taking up these new services. Dan Belsky is a professor at Columbia University's Butler Aging Center. If someone doesn't have the time or frankly the money to invest in a screening like the one I underwent, what do you tell them to do? Eat a healthy diet, exercise, 
Fill your life with things that matter to you. A social network surrounding and supporting you, that can be incredibly important for building healthy longevity. If you want to try it, Belsky says, talk to your primary care doctor about the tests you want to take, research the facility and provider credentials, and avoid untested procedures that promise anti-aging effects. So the, the big question, can you tell me how long I'm going to live? You are certainly younger biologically than you are chronologically. We will get to the Smucker's Jar. And as a result of my visit, I've actually changed a lot of my habits. I've purchased a weighted vest. It's six pounds. I wear it when I walk to help increase the bone density in my hips. I've also upped my protein take by adding things like fish, turkey jerky, and protein shakes to my weekly meals. But again, these clinics, they're not cheap. My visit cost about $5,000. Some of these longevity clinics offer services throughout the entire year though. That can go for $60,000 or more. A lot of it is not covered by insurance, so always ask ahead of time. Now we turn to another hot topic, anti-gray hair products. According to Advanced Dermatology, 30% of Americans say they spend the most money on their hair color. It can be tempting to try a product that promises to reduce or delay gray hair, but do they really work? Call it 50 shades of anti-gray. One of the hottest hair care trends for those looking to hold back the hands of time. I recently found this gray hair treatment. We're hoping for the best. It's supposed to go deep into the scalp to the bulb and restore the hair color. All you have to do is target your gray areas. Some sharing their experience on social media, trying popular serums and supplements, promising to delay the gray. This is what it looks like. I'm also not ready. Just apply it kind of in lines. For any salt with my pepper. Feels nice. If anything, I'm at least getting a scalp massage. With 6 to 23% of the world's population showing at least 50% gray hair coverage by age 50, in the past year, search interest in anti-gray hair serum climbing 280% in the U.S. alone. We just have to kind of accept some facts of life, and gray hair is one of them. Dr. Mona Gohara is a board-certified dermatologist. What causes gray hair? We're all born with a certain number of hair follicles and a predetermined number of hair follicle cycles. There are little pigment producing factories in our hair follicles called melanocytes that give us our hair color. Sometimes the melanocytes get tired, they just don't wanna work anymore. And that's when our hair turns gray. She says anti-gray products aim to stimulate those melanocytes. Do they work? Can I make a joke and say it's kind of in the gray zone? <laughs> Whether the melanocytes are actually nudged is questionable. I don't know that we have any definitive science to say that that's actually happening. One well-known plant-based serum containing ingredients like caffeine, peptides, and vitamins promises to deliver real, visible results in as soon as 90 days. According to its website, the company behind the serum bases the statement on a three-month clinical study of 15 participants, of which 64% reported seeing less gray hair. For best results, the brand also recommends using its Gray Delay Supplement, a blend of vitamins, antioxidants, minerals, and botanicals, described as ideal for those with little to no gray hair. While the Food and Drug Administration does not review anti-gray hair products for safety before they hit the market, Gohara considers them low risk for side effects, which could include irritation from serums or gastrointestinal issues with supplements. They're pretty safe, and that's why I think it's okay to try it on a small area. But she says check with your doctor before trying them. While prices vary per product, serum and supplement combos can cost $70 to $140, with most brands offering a discounted price when you sign up for a monthly subscription. Gohara says before spending your money, look to the root of the problem. It is 100% about our genetics. Now, there are other things that can give us gray hair, Vicky. There are some- Like my kids. That, yeah, oh, definitely. Your teenagers. <laughs> In a statement to NBC News, Vegamore says their serum helps reduce the appearance of grays on new hair growth, and their supplement helps preserve the hair's natural pigment and delays grays. All right, coming up, think twice before posting photos online. The unintended consequences of a photo post.
are back with a warning about photo fakes. As more of us rely on online connections professionally and personally, how do you know who you're really talking to? Is that profile picture the real person? It's a problem that's becoming more common. Here are the red flags you need to watch for. How many of you have been threatened by someone who's upset thinking they know you? All of you. They're young, they're good looking, and they're on social media. Kayla, Cammie, Tristan, and Justin say scammers have stolen their images to create fake online profiles and then use those profiles to lure people into online relationships, grooming them into sending money. I had a family contact me and they wanted me to inform their grandfather like that it wasn't me that he was talking to. Is this something you have to deal with every day? Yeah, 100%. All say their photos now live on hundreds, even thousands of fake social media profiles, many times using their real names. I've actually been contacted by like the FBI, NCIS, basically confirming that I'm not behind all of this. These women, they spend thousands of dollars thinking I'm gonna come see them. Justin says he saw a post online, a woman celebrating her engagement to him. He messaged her and warned her husband-to-be wasn't real. Then the scammer saw Justin's comment. The scammer calls me and he's like, you're messing with my business. And I'm like, it's my face. This is not your business. Justin recorded the call. Oh, everybody but this poor girl, right? What did you say? Well, no. Tristan, a fitness coach, says some women who thought they were having an online relationship with him even hired him for in-person training. They just want to confirm that it's actually me, and then they'll just waste my time. Cybercrime continues to rise in America. Last year, reports of romance scams alone amounted to a reported loss of $1.3 billion. Among the top lies used to ask for money, someone close is sick, hurt, or in jail, and I am in the military. Three of these four have served or are serving. I think that military personnel are targeted because you can use the excuse because of security concerns. I can't send you a picture right now. I'm not allowed to video chat. California-based Social Catfish is a people search engine that focuses on online safety. Their search results help customers find and remove fake profiles. The internet's still the wild, wild west. There are very few laws to protect you online for the use of your images. CEO David McClellan says these stolen images can lead to very real danger. I had people actually showing up and, you know, getting getting upset with me in person. And it's even happened to me. Vicky, we decided to run your image and here's what we found. We found a Vicky Wynn channel selling for $799. We also found a clubhouse link of somebody actually using your image to most likely talk to other people online. And we found a celebrity foot website that has all your feet pics. My feet? That is gross and weird. McClellan says you can take steps to protect your images. Set your social media profiles to private. Limit what you post, add watermarks to your photos, and run reverse image searches. It's free with Google Images. If you can't meet the person within like a week, it's not real. By the way, those websites that were found with my pictures, Social Catfish has helped me take those down. And a few good reminders, never send money to someone you haven't met. Anytime someone online asks you for money, stop contact with them immediately and report that to the FTC. Artificial intelligence technology is also making it easier for scammers. A simple phone call is all it takes to extort money. The FBI says on average, victims of schemes using new voice technology lose about $11,000 each. And recently, scams have reached a new level with AI clones that look and sound like real celebrities spreading fake messages online. Today we are launching an investment project. That From Elon Musk pitching an investment opportunity to Gail King promoting a weight loss product. Follow the link right now and learn more about my secret. It seems fake ads made with AI are everywhere. Even Tom Hanks has found himself an unwilling spokesperson, warning his Instagram followers, there's a video out there promoting some dental plan with an AI version of me. I have nothing to do with it. 
While celebrity endorsement scams are nothing new, in the age of AI, these deceitful deep fakes are becoming more convincing, fooling those who buy into them. The FBI says last year victims lost a record $10.2 billion to scams and other online crimes. With just a few seconds of audio, new artificial intelligence software can clone a person's voice. As an actor, I pretend for a living. As an actor, I pretend for a living. And a scammer can make it say anything. The Federal Trade Commission issuing a recent warning that voice cloning technology is making family emergency scams more convincing. Earlier this year, several Oregon school districts warned parents about a spate of fake kidnapping calls. A recent global survey showed one in four people saying they've experienced an AI voice cloning scam or knew someone who had. I got a phone call from an unknown number. And so I pick up the phone and I say hello. And my daughter Brianna says, Mom, and she's crying and sobbing. Jennifer DeStefano says she was convinced her 15-year-old daughter Brianna had been kidnapped. And uh, she says, Mom, these bad men have me. Help me, help me, help me. She fades off as the man takes over the phone and says, Listen here, I've got your daughter. She says the scammer threatened to harm her daughter unless she sent him a million dollars. How much did it sound like your daughter? It sounded, I never doubted it was her. I, I had a full conversation with her. It was the way she cries, it was the way she sobs, it was the way she would respond to me. Jennifer was able to connect with her husband who confirmed Brianna was safe. After warning her friends and neighbors, Jennifer says she's heard of similar incidents whether it was a kidnapping, whether it was an accident, you know, they were in jail, all these different types of scenarios. We're going to have a completely new group of scammers and threat actors. Wasim Khalid is CEO and co-founder of Blackbird AI. I saw that in some of these voice cloning programs are as cheap as $5 a month, and you can take someone's voice off of a social media video, use AI, and make that voice say whatever you want it to do. Is that really happening? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's basically the, the revolution in AI over the last six months. The key takeaway here is generative AI is going to be the catalyst to drive misinformation, disinformation, and warped realities further and faster than we've ever seen before. He says if you get a suspicious call about a family emergency, first authenticate the person by having them confirm information only you two would know. Have a private safe word for your family and have someone else call your loved one's actual phone number. Because with AI, what you see and hear is not always what you get. Up next, a new Uber feature that allows teens to order their own rides. Consumer Confidential continues right after the break.
popular rideshare Uber has a new feature that could make things a lot easier for busy parents. Have you ever had a child stuck at school while you're at work and unable to pick them up? Introducing Uber for Teens. Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome to what we're sure will be our greatest year at Rydell. As classic as the movie Grease, so is the ritual of returning to class. And with it comes hectic teen schedules. School, sports practice, band, even going to the mall. Solving the riddle of all those rides can be worse than a wordle. I should know, my own teenage daughter Emerson is as busy as ever. So we're trying out Uber for Teens. It's a new service that allows teens to order their own rides. It starts here on my phone in the Uber app. Teens can actually create an account on their own. A parent or guardian has to invite them. So you go to your Uber app, hit account, and then family and teens right there, invite family, and there it is, add a teen. The app, designed for teens 13 to 17, sends Emerson an invite, and from there, she creates her own teen account after reading a safety tutorial. Uber says parents should talk to their teens before they use the service, remind them to check the license plate, ask the driver who they're picking up before getting in, and never sit in the front seat. I'm ordering my ride now. Oh, here I am at work and I just got a text. Yep, it's a notification. It says Emerson just requested a ride and the driver is arriving in four minutes. The car pulls up. Hey, how are you? Who are you here for? Um, Emerson. Yep, yeah, all right. But the driver can't start the ride without a personal identification number or PIN from Emerson's app to ensure she's in the right car. We will have uh, one uh, PIN for me. The PIN is 6255. Five. She's on her way, while I follow along from my office. It shows me Emerson's been picked up, and it shows me she'll be dropped off in seven minutes. I can even call the driver to check in. Is Emerson in the car with you? Yes, ma'am. She is here. Great. Is everything going okay? Everything perfect, ma'am. Just perfect. Hey, Emerson, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Everything's good on your end? Going great. Uber says drivers with teen passengers can't change drop-off locations, and if the drive goes off course or stops for extended periods of time, Uber will call the driver and teen, and if necessary, 911. Uber Vice President Sachin Kansal notes the safety features are mandatory and cannot be turned off. Our kids are very precious cargo. For parents, the most important thing was visibility and tracking. Can any driver drive teens or do they have to go through a vetting process? They have to be an experienced driver on our platform and they have to be positively rated throughout. In addition, Uber says it conducts criminal background checks and reviews driving records every year, providing a new option for busy parents just in time for the start of school. Thanks for the ride. We also tried the new Uber Eats feature for teens multiple times, but we did experience a few glitches from not getting notifications to receiving the wrong order. Uber tells us that this feature is still being tested and developed. Coming up, the latest housing trend, what to know about build to rent communities that are popping up across the country.
Imagine living in a three or four bedroom home, two car garage and a backyard without all the responsibilities of home ownership. Introducing build to rent communities, entire neighborhoods of single family homes built just for renting. They're popping up across the country and they're already helping to alleviate the national housing shortage. The American dream isn't for sale, it's for rent in this community near Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to Harmony Heights, 153 and four bedroom single family homes, all brand new and part of the build to rent trend. Renters enjoy modern appliances and luxury finishes, spacious closets and smart home technology. An app allows them to request fixes. Their monthly rent and a small fee cover all maintenance and landscaping. Think of an apartment complex, except you break it down into single family homes. Richard Ross is CEO of Quinn Residences. Who is renting these homes? A third of our residents are people who can't come up with a down payment. They can't afford seven, seven and a half percent mortgage today. But two thirds of our residents are residents by choice, meaning they elect to rent. While the median sales price for existing homes has dropped nearly 2% from last year, a recent report shows renting as more cost effective than home ownership in 95% of the U.S. right now. Here in the United States, there are almost a thousand of these build to rent communities with single family detached homes. More than 500 are in the works. Each community has 50 or more homes renting for an average of $2,000 a month. I never even heard of a community that was strictly a rental community. So I was pretty intrigued by it. Luke and Rebecca Montgomery spent a year looking to buy a home, but struggled to find anything within their price range and big enough for their family. Then they found this neighborhood on Zillow. This is not the time to buy or, or build. We would rather wait it out a little bit and see what happens. So this was just the right solution for us. How nice is it to have the benefits of home ownership without the responsibility. It's nice to be able to know that in the event something happens, it's not all going to fall on your shoulders. I can find myself very bored. I don't have to cut the grass. Empty nesters Marco and Myra Martinez says the low maintenance lifestyle gives them more time to enjoy the things they love. I love to hear the birds uh, singing and to see the trees uh, behind my house. It's beautiful. A career change prompting their move from Texas. The couple says instead of buying, they decided to rent so they could see if they liked the area first. This community offered us a, a great opportunity to rent a house where we feel safe. You don't have to own all the time. I mean, you can make the decision of renting and, and, and thinking about it. And sometimes that's better than just uh, owning. You can use an online calculator like one of these to see if it makes sense for you to rent or buy in a particular location. People are taking a different path to home ownership. David Howard, CEO of the National Rental Home Council, says Build to Rent provides an innovative way to introduce supply into the housing market, which is an estimated 6 million homes short. What does it mean when it comes to affordability? It is almost $1,000 less expensive on average to rent a single family home than to make a mortgage payment on a single family home. When considering Build to Rent, experts say do your homework. Look for reputable developers. You can search those affiliated with the National Rent Home Council at buildforrenthomes.com. Also, think about location and if the community matches your family's lifestyle. Tips to help you lay the foundation for your version of the American dream. That is our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. The hills are alive with the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on, it's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal 
has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots, taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do. Diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs> My name is Amy Traverso, and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, sort of the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown Expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England. As they say on the boat, they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. Back in you know the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. Two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time. They were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great-great-grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted, but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington State could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. Apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't going to get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just going to make a nice pie. <laughs> 
Now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples, and that's it. Where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago. And that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily. And I got a chance to give it a try, or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves. I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid 20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall. There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> My family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler and you're thinking about like comforts of home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. Labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you-pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards 
all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. Okay. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. Okay. Right next to it is some Macintosh apples. Okay. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes it comes Just free. Like that. So that means that it's ripe. Okay. And the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. So we we treat these like eggs and oh, we place them in place the bucket. Place them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the honey crisp. Honey crisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the honey crisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was gonna look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about, okay, are you gonna come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this will be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together. American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers. And our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells the story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it. And she would bake it in the oven just along with hers, and I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. 
funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies, and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. So once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity, she just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. I, honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old. Prove it, it's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. It's the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so Thank you. much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. It's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough, so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of uh, flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hand. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name's Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody <laughs> loved it. Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. Is it best spot? No, everything I do is very how would Liz want it, want it done. Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May. But her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> now it's very, uh... It's very special. I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations.
make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by K. K. Thank you. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy, candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And then when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, I wanted him to have gold candy apples as a favor. We found someone to make them, and then she encouraged me, you know, you can make these yourself. You can do this yourself. Wanting to enjoy candy apples year round, Kim began developing unique candy recipes at home. Her kids, her first taste testers. Eventually, it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream full time. There's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples and you, love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought that would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in Candy Apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely gonna support it. It's gonna become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmers markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating and it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dip treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival, the turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans, is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. We have five kids ranging uh, ages two to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was apple. <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. 
I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from from her and then my mom working the store um, she was actually washing apples as well she's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on last year last april uh, my mother-in-law passed away and after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family. And so two weeks later, my mom passed and we weren't expecting that of you know either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by that we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, love and passion. You know, a great job managing both. Apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. Hey guys, welcome to The Boost. From football superstars to foodie features, we have a fun show teed up for you today. Let's start with one of the internet's first viral videos. Joe Fryer caught up with David after the dentist more than a decade after he became one of the biggest things on YouTube. How did it go? I didn't feel anything. His name is David DeVore, but you probably know him as... David after yeah. dentist. How do you feel about that, that title? I, uh, I love it. It's, it's been a fun adventure. It's been its own part of my life. Starting with the part when he was seven and still feeling pretty loopy yeah. after dental surgery. I, I feel funny. Why is this happening to me? A moment immortalized by his dad, David Sr. You know, you remember those times you always said, if I only had a camera? Well, I actually had a camera that day, so I just got really yeah. lucky. That was it. In the two-minute clip, David Jr. is earnestly philosophical. One moment. Is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. Bluntly flustered the next. Stay in your seat. <laughs> the anesthesia, of course, did wear off, but the video's legend would only grow. But when you watch it, what's your favorite part? I think the end when I just like, ugh. Within days of posting it on YouTube back in 2009, the clip racked up a few million views. At that point, they were like, OK, I've heard of this thing called viral, going viral. I think that's what we're doing. And what did you think? Um, I was just in shock. There was some backlash from those who thought dad was exploiting his son, but for the most part, folks loved it. Is this real life? The video was part of a Super Bowl ad for Vizio. Homer Simpson even referenced it on The Simpsons. Which of you is the YouTube of the kid high on dentist gas? You. And of course, they appeared on Today. My friends thought it was funny at first, but then later they stopped talking about it. You could have been embarrassed by it and yeah. wish it had never happened, or you could have your attitude. 
Why do you think you have your attitude? I could only comprehend so much at that age. Well, I was just kind of going with the flow, and I was like, oh, I get to go to New York. It's like, great, this is fun. People, like, I recognize people weren't making fun of me. They've made a number of licensing deals, not to mention the YouTube ad revenue, which was helpful during the 2009 recession. Had been selling real estate, and that went away overnight, so it, it literally, you know, saved us. Today, the video has racked up more than 140 million views. Does that just blow your mind? It does. Yeah, it's it's crazy. David is now a senior at the University of Florida studying computer science, not dentistry. When he was accepted here, the school's president reenacted David's viral moment. This is funny that you didn't bring it up. As for his classmates, at first, many didn't know David's identity. Dude, what? <laughs> He's just, I would have never known. He's very humble about it and he, he's never gone out of his way to tell me. And I didn't know that fact, and then someone told me later on, and I was like, no way. <laughs> but I was in the midst of fame. <laughs> Is this going to be forever? Turns out this moment did live forever. That's okay. It's still a welcome part. Is this real life? Of David's real life. This next young man went viral more recently on TikTok for being wise well beyond his years. Savannah and I sat down with a six-year-old with a very grown-up morning routine. Six-year-old Ion Jump wakes up before his siblings. <laughs> you know why? He wants to enjoy his lemon and honey tea. He wants to read his chapter book. His mom just posted a video. It happens all the time. That video went viral, got nearly three million views and counting. Oh, my gosh. One comment said he looks like he's got himself a healthy 401k. <laughs> Another asking, can he be my life coach? Well, yes, he can, because Ion is here along with his parents, Alyssa and Alpha. Hi, good guys. Morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Hi, Ion. How are you? I'm good. You are? Now, tell us about your morning routine. Why do you like to take some time to calm down, read, and have your tea? Well, I like to enjoy myself because sometimes when I wake up, and I go to school, I don't have enough time. So that's why I, my mom said that if I finish my morning routine quickly, then I can do a quiet activity. Well, that is so wise, not only of your mommy, but for yes. you to take that advice. I know you have, uh, you got a brother and sister mm -hmm. at home, so it's probably loud once they get up. So you need a little time to yourself. Quiet time. What do you do during your quiet time? What does it feel like? When, when I have my quiet time, I can read a book, drink my tea, or I can play with a toy or any other quiet activity. Okay. Okay. Talk to the We're in love you. I, by the way, <laughs> if my kids what's are watching, here. you're grounded um, forever. Okay. I mean, Alyssa yeah. and Alpha, yeah. this extraordinary child. Yes. Thank you. Well. <laughs> Extraordinary parents uh -huh. as well. Thank How did you, you do this? Thank we would like a step-by-step -step guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do not have a step-by-step -step guy. But you know, we started um, with reading to Ion really early, mm -hmm. really from the womb. You know, mm -hmm. we've been reading to him, and we it was a uh, an act something that we did at night. Every night we read to him. Um, and so he's just grown to have a love for reading. You know, he looks forward to getting books as a gift. Mm -hmm. He's asking for different books. We introduce him to um, different types of stories and. As far as the tea, that's really dad. Dad drinks yeah. tea. <laughs> so I grew so. up on, uh, I come from a Caribbean household, so I grew up on tea um, every day. And of course, Ion sees me, you know, drinking my tea in the morning. So one day we just introduced tea. Um, he has his own tea. It's special. It's lemon, honey, and water. Uh -huh. It's not, you know, regular tea. So he has his special tea. Well, what's interesting about this is a lot of our kids do like to read, but we can't get them to be calm yes. like this in the morning. <laughs> I think liking this is his nature, you think though. Are you just a calm kind of kid? Yes. You are? For the most part, yeah. Because I mean, he's still a kid. He's still a kid. <laughs> right. But I remember back when we first met Ion, mm -hmm. and he was talking about affirmations. Yeah. And that was something that caught fire. What were the three affirmations he said? You said I'm smart. I am blessed. I can do anything. You are smart. <laughs> you are blessed. You can do anything. Do, was this something that you just sort of repeated to yes. him? Yes. And then did you actually see it? manifesting yes him? yes i taught it to him when he was two um i just yeah. wanted to oh is that it playing? that's him <laughs> we hear you um yeah. i just wanted him to have something so that he could feel confident and motivated you know as he got older 
and then the video that you are talking about is when he was three we were walking to school and he yes. just started saying it by himself by himself yeah so i just recorded it and you know i posted it um but he says it i hear him saying it to himself i don't have to prompt him anymore if he's having a difficult time, he'll be like, I can do this. I can do anything. <laughs> By the way, you so, wrote a children's working. book, didn't you? Yes. What's it called? Two books. Yes. Um, yes. With my sister. The yes. first book is called I Am Smart. I Am Blessed. I Can Do Anything. Yes. And the second book is I Am Amazing. Wow. I yeah. think you guys are amazing because Thank here's... You. He's obviously an extraordinary child, and we yeah, all yeah. know if your parents, it's like they just, they are who they are, right. you know? <laughs> right. We can only do so much. Exactly. But I love that you... Get, you trusted him enough mm -hmm. to give him that time to do something that is yes. quite mature. Sometimes yes. I think we underestimate mm -hmm. yes. what our kids can do. Oh, and you so have cool. obviously, obviously set high expectations that Ion has met. Yeah. Ion is just a, you know, he's a very special kid. His name means gift from God, and he's truly oh. just been a gift um, to yeah. us since he's been here. He's just an awesome kid. He's just naturally yes. amazing. Ion, do you ever think about what you want to be when you get bigger, when you grow up? Yes, I want to be a scientist when I grow. And I have my own scientist club at school. You my do? friend Peter's the boss. <laughs> really? And why do you want to be a scientist? Because I'm going to make a formula that I can rub on people's heads, and that will make them never die. Until a few months, it will fade away. Ion, I oh, believe you. Ion, I you do can too. do anything. After the break, our exclusive sneak peek at the Eagles' upcoming holiday album. Not the band, the football team. Stay with us. the boost it's already been a fun football season with no shortage of news on and off the field one team that is making the headlines the Philadelphia Eagles and some of the members on the team are getting set to release a new holiday album our very own Chanel Jones joined them to learn more fireworks to begin will we have fireworks on the field tonight under bright lights in the city of brotherly love Two of the NFL's top teams, the Philadelphia Eagles and Miami Dolphins, squaring off overnight in a high-stakes showdown. Philly soaring to victory to move to 6-1, and one, tied for the best record in the NFL. No question, the guy who leads the way is Jason Kelsey right up front. Jason Kelsey continuing his incredible streak, extending his Eagles franchise record to 146 consecutive starts. <laughs> Congratulations are in order for you. You set an Eagles record for starting the most games in a row. Yeah. Hey, he's, been, <laughs> he's still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> the center is a veteran on the field. And now in the music studio, where he and his teammates, offensive tackles Jordan Mailata and Lane Johnson, have been working on their second holiday album. We got an exclusive first look of the players tackling a Mariah Carey classic. Make my wish come. These NFL players showing how the Eagles have some songbirds. All I want for Christmas is you. How did that feel to take on that song? I mean, it's a classic. 
Yeah, that, I mean, it was, it was, it was kind of nerve-wracking at first, just because you didn't know, can't really do the same key as the Queen of <laughs> Holidays. I mean, she's incredible. Yeah. So we kind of had to dial it back a couple keys. A Philly special Christmas special comes after their first album was a hit, turning casual singers into recording artists. We sing around a lot. Like Lane and I go in the same car after a game sometime and we'll listen to songs. But it's not like Christmas at all. And that first day of the studio. Yeah, then it got real when we got <laughs> <laughs> In what way did it get real? Well, you're doing vocal warm-ups with uh, Coach E. <gasps> And you realize your vocal ability may not be, uh, he knows, Australian offensive tackle Jordan Mailata stunned Jason Kelsey last year with his rendition of White Christmas. I said, I, 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 I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. For the latest album, he took on a duet with Philly legend Patti LaBelle. This time, he was the speechless one. I got stage right. Really? Like, real bad. Yeah. I, they were like, you know your mic's working. <laughs> you know your mic's working. I just, every time I opened my mouth to sing with her, I just couldn't. Yeah. It's all for a good cause. That album raised more than a million dollars for local charities. Santa Claus is coming. They've also garnered a legion of new fans, including Jason Kelsey's daughter, Wyatt. Look at you. Chad. Who's a rising star on social media. Why it all last Christmas? She always kept asking to hear Santa is coming to town. They're, they're all into it for sure. Philly locals are into it too. One family bidding for an awkward Christmas photo with the trio. The proceeds benefiting the Eagles Autism Foundation. The players feeling lots of love from the Philadelphia community. I think once they found out, you know, it wasn't a joke and there was actually some mm -hmm. little bit of talent on there uh, and ability, uh, <laughs> it made a lot more, uh, a lot better. As for future Eagles holiday albums, well, they may have a special cameo in mind. So true story, on the way here, I turn on the music and I hear you guys and it was a genuine like joy. Good. And the person I was in the car with, they're like, what's going on? Who is this? And I'm like, well, it's secret, but we're listening to a song. You know, it's the Eagles. <laughs> these are the, these are the Eagles players. And true story, are they singing with Taylor Swift? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not this one. Not this time around. No? Maybe. I don't know who that is. <laughs> it can know. happen. Talk about, about raising money for charity. You could break the internet with that, that duet. Would, that would be pretty incredible, but. Maybe volume three. Yeah, maybe, maybe in the future. Maybe volume three. Merry Christmas, Philadelphia. You. and a happy new year. Turning now to a musical tradition here in New York that happens every Sunday in Harlem. NBC's Rahema Ellis has this story. In New York City's Harlem, this landmark apartment building is showing its age. But the music inside never gets old. For the past 30 years, even during COVID, on Sunday afternoons, Marjorie Elliott's living room becomes a small jazz concert hall. With her son, Rudy Dreers, they entertain about 40 people, packed into the parlor, the hallway, even the kitchen, for two hours of free jazz. This kind of magic. The concerts began in 1993, after Marjorie's other son, Philip, died of kidney failure on a Sunday. I used to go crazy on Sundays, crying. But soon she learned to manage her sorrow and celebrate life. Was music your therapy? Always. You, you, you go to what you know. And having played all my life, I went to that. Now, the music draws people from all over. First come, first seated. Where are you from? I'm from Germany. I'm from Denmark. I'm from Harlem, just a couple blocks away. I feel like showing up here on Sundays, this is like my church. Marjorie promises her guests the jazz is here to stay. They have taken a story that's considered really sad and made something joyous from that and I'm grateful to them. And we're grateful for you. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, Harlem. Coming up, we're going on a food lover's dream journey. Stay with us.
We're back on the boost with a heartwarming story out of California where the homemade cafe feeds the hearts and souls of those in need with a little help from the community. It's just a little card pinned to the door. But for the customers and staff at the homemade cafe in Berkeley, California, it buys the most important meal of the day. So they can take one off and hand it to a waiter. The card says everybody eats, and it means just that. Basically, we treat them just like any other customer. They just don't get a bill. No one should go hungry in this world. Colin Dorn owns the homemade cafe. His breakfast of eggs, potatoes, toast, and coffee is served to anyone experiencing homelessness or food insecurity. The meal comes with a seat at any open table. When I first owned the restaurant, you know, people would come and they'd ask customers for food or panhandle. I just, you know, told them to ask me. So, you know, you don't need to bother our customers, but we will gladly feed you. And Colin stands by his word with the help of the community and their donations to help others. For every $5 a customer donates, another card goes on the board. Sir for Steve, how's the food? It's great, and I am so incredibly grateful to how they've helped me out in the past couple of weeks. What does it mean for you, though, to have a place where you can just have a hot meal when times are tough? Oh, it means everything, it really does. The cafe has been around since 1979. You ate here when you grew up. I did. I had the bacon and the French toast. <laughs> Colin and his family were neighborhood regulars. He went on to college in New York and planned on becoming a lawyer, but never quite let go of what he really loved. Does this feel like a world away from what you wanted to be? Um, what I thought I wanted to be, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I like food, I like the energy, I like the interactions with the people. In 2011, he bought the neighborhood cafe and made it his own. You've always had maybe an affinity for this place, yeah? Oh, absolutely. It's always been sort of a fixture in the neighborhood, in the community. Hi, guys. Hey, Hello. Hey, I, have, I think I have chocolate pancakes. It's kind of like a family atmosphere. Right? It is. Daniel was once a customer who needed to take one of those meal cards. I lived on this street right away for like eight years. You lived on this street? On like this street, right here. Now he brings home a paycheck as the cafe's dishwasher. I came in one morning to just ask for food. And it's like, hey, brother, do you want to work? It meant a lot for me, giving me a job, waking up to say, oh, I got somewhere to go. Fortunately, the homemade cafe family is tight, Colin says, because last year was nearly a recipe for disaster. We were about this close to closing. Financial fallout from the pandemic, inflation, and meal delivery services hit the restaurant's bottom line hard. Take me back to when times were tough. Yeah, the community came through. My staff agreed to take a 20% pay cut to keep us open. Customers also led the charge for a GoFundMe account that's still turning out support so everyone eats can continue. People ask me all the time, well, how does that affect your bottom line? How can you afford to do it? If anything, the bottom line's gotten better. You feeding people for free has actually helped your bottom yes, line. Yes, it's absolutely counterintuitive to the standard capitalistic model of running a restaurant or a business. But the more free food I give out, the more people I have come in and pay. Colin says he never expected such an outpouring of support would come with a simple breakfast. Does that surprise you? You know, I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish there wasn't hungry people. Order up, please. And it's given me faith that doing the right thing, doing things that need to be done, taking care of your fellow man, whoever they may be, whatever position they're in, is the right thing to do, and it's paying off. Now to one of New York's most vibrant areas, Chinatown. Our Harry Smith took a trip there to explore everything from its traditional markets to a fine dining noodle dynasty. A walk through New York's Chinatown is a food lover's dream journey. Our first stop, a grocery store. This is such a pure window into a thousand year old culture and cuisine. Our guide is Francis Lam, writer, publisher, and host of The Splendid Table on public radio. Anywhere you travel is you go to the market. You go see what people shop for. You go see what people eat. You go see what's important to people. Lamb's mother shopped here, as have generations of Chinese. For here is a wall of ramen. I am probably 45% by body weight noodle. They're 
all these different noodles, rice noodles, Thai style, Japanese style. But the dried foods are the pride of Po Wing Fong food market. Delicacies. These are dried abalones. Pricey. Oh, they're wild, 220 bucks a pound. Delicious. It right. doesn't taste like a fresh oyster, it just tastes like the evil superhero version of an oyster. Like it's just darker, <laughs> moodier, you know, it's like Batman. Sophia Sao is in charge here, but it's her mother who has been behind the counter for as long as anyone can remember. What does it mean to you to follow in your family's footsteps to, to be running this store now? For me personally, I like to think that I'm continuing their legacy. So I think that I'm not only just helping my family financially, but also the community. Hang around a grocery store long enough and you'll get hungry. What's our next stop? I want to take you to the second coming of a classic tofu shop that was sort of more in the heart of Chinatown. Inside, we watch the modern day version of the ancient alchemy of tofu. Paul Ang is the proprietor of Fong An Tofu Shop. It's starting to coagulate, and so now I'm going to cover it, and yeah. it will set, kind of like, uh, like jello. The finished product, though, the texture of silk on your tongue. Serve sweet or savory. But you have that really, really creamy pudding. You get, like, the crunch of that shallot, and you get, like, the little crispiness of the pickles. We tried both. It's really one of those where has this been all my life sort of taste experiences. On we wandered, wanting to stop everywhere and taste even what we did not recognize. She said you can eat it raw if you want. What do you think? Oh my God, this is so good. It's like a, if a cucumber and a pear had a baby. The energy in Chinatown is palpable but life here is not what it once was. In January of 2020, yeah. people stopped coming to Chinatown because it was the China virus. Many a store shuttered, some permanently. It's the economic devastation that we felt all over the country, but you layer on top of that a rise in hate, racist rhetoric, a rise of scapegoating. It's rough, man. It's rough. Yet people persevere, and perhaps no place better represents that than our last stop, Huayan. Chinese fine dining. Chef Shen Lei Tang, son of the original chef, holds forth in the kitchen. Among the specialties, sesame noodles. It's killer, right? Yeah. It's like a little bit of garlic, a little bit of scallion. But you can taste everything, and like every flavor kind of comes and goes. Honestly, I heard, okay, we're gonna go have cold sesame noodles at this really <laughs> fancy restaurant. <laughs> this, it's like this exceeds, yeah. Yeah. exceeds my expectations. Far exceeds. The shredded beef, best I've ever had. And the key? How come your food is so much better than everybody else's? Cooking from your heart. Cooking from your heart. Stick around, we got another fun story for you you do not want to miss coming up after the break.
Welcome back to The Boost. I can't wait for you guys to see this next story. Check it out. A little baby named Delaney loves her grandma. So when she pops in for a visit, Delaney gets more than just a little bit excited. Take a look. Delaney, who's here? time okay the can you best. imagine that every time you walk through the door that's what you got oh. that's what roker gets every time sky well, sees not him. yet but oh, i'm not hoping yet. and that's going to do it for us thank you so much for joining us on the boost we love having fun with you sharing these uplifting stories and we are going to keep the good times rolling tomorrow on today all day Hello and thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential here on Today All Day. I'm Vicki Wynn. From finding affordable housing to battling gray hair and even new service to shuttle your teens around, we have something for everyone. But first, many of us are looking for ways to live longer and feel healthier as we age. Could the answer be found in so-called longevity clinics? They're not cheap. To see what they're like, I checked into a longevity clinic right here in Manhattan. The aging process dead in its tracks. Unlike in the movie Death Becomes Her, drinking a magic potion won't make you live forever. I'm a girl. But that doesn't mean we aren't obsessed with living longer. Even celebrities like Maria Menounos promoting oh, the health benefits of full body I scans to Hoda to on Today. That you have to be the CEO of your health. Longevity medicine is the business of helping people live healthier, longer lives. Last year, it topped $26 billion in the U.S. I'm here outside the Princeton Longevity Center in Manhattan to give you a look at what happens. But first, I had to fill out an extensive health questionnaire. Everything from my eating habits to my sleeping habits to my family's medical history. And we are here bright and early today because this whole experience is gonna take about eight hours. Welcome to Princeton Longevity Center. After check-in, I'm taken to my private lounge where I'll rest between medical exams and tests. Okay, I'm told the first thing we're doing this morning is getting my vital signs. They're gonna draw some blood. They're checking my hormone levels. They're gonna look at kidney and liver function. And they're doing it all this morning so that we can get the results by this afternoon. Pretty quick turnaround. I'm getting a bone density and body scan to measure my bone strength and muscle mass. Blood draws to screen for things like genetic cancer markers, cholesterol, and vitamin deficiencies. Oh, last one already? You're on the last one. Yay. A test of my resting metabolic rate to see how many calories I burn just by existing. So when I'm resting, my body's burning a, a, a thousand calories. Around a thousand, around a thousand, thousand calories. calories. And a standard physical. Ever been told you snore? No, I don't think I snore. Dr. David Fine founded the Princeton Longevity Center in 2001 to help people optimize their health with nutrition, exercise, and medical care with the hope of living longer and better. Who makes an ideal patient? Because for some people, knowing what's coming down the road can make them more anxious and more stressed. On the one hand, that's true. On the other hand, though, you have two choices. You can find out what's going on or it can find you. Where is the sweet spot where some things may resolve on their own versus I'm going in and doing so much intervention and some of it may not be necessary. Well, you know, certainly a lot of things do resolve on their own. What we're really looking for really are more of the things that are going to be the chronic diseases of getting older. Your risk of diabetes, your risk of heart attacks and strokes, your, your cancer risk, for example. My day continues with a CT scan of my heart and body. A few tests down, a few more to go. Nearly three and a half hours later. Breakfast at last. A quick bite and a cardiac stress test with a sports physiologist. This is definitely aptly named stress test. Then a vision and hearing test. Next up is the ultimate athlete stress test. I thought that walking thing was hard. I think this is going to be really rough. The price you have to pay if you want to be an athlete. <laughs> what if you're just a reporter? I'm hooked up to the same machine used by Olympic athletes to measure my oxygen output and heart health. You got it. You got it. The view from the top unbeatable but after 10 minutes with the speed and incline creeping up i'm beat ah i survived it barely i get my results quickly your act, heart is acting like a 28 year old
But when I meet with the nutritionist who reviewed my food logs, she tells me to beef up my protein intake. Out of all your calories, only 15% is coming from protein. How much so should be coming? should be 30 to 40. Oh, wow. Yes. Then I get the verdict on my overall health. On the whole, you're actually in really good health. Dr. Fine says the scans did find the bone density in my hips is below normal, and my body fat percentage was above average at 36%. He recommended weight-bearing exercise and strength training. It's time to ass. pump exactly. me up. Mm. Then an unexpected result. You had a small nodule okay. over here in your left lung. It's this little guy right there. Wow, okay. Dr. Fine says it's likely a harmless lymph node, but recommended I get scanned in a year to check for growth. We don't yet have a lot of data on the experiences of people who are taking up these new services. Dan Belsky is a professor at Columbia University's Butler Aging Center. If someone doesn't have the time or, frankly, the money to invest in a screening like the one I underwent, what do you tell them to do? Eat a healthy diet, exercise, fill your life with things that matter to you. A social network surrounding and supporting you, that can be incredibly important for building healthy longevity. If you want to try it, Belsky says, talk to your primary care doctor about the tests you want to take, research the facility and provider credentials, and avoid untested procedures that promise anti-aging effects. So the, the big question, can you tell me how long I'm gonna live? You are certainly younger biologically than you are chronologically. We will get to the Smucker's Jar. And as a result of my visit, I have actually changed a lot of my habits. I've purchased a weighted vest. It's six pounds. I wear it when I walk to help increase the bone density in my hips. I've also upped my protein take by adding things like fish, turkey jerky, and protein shakes to my weekly meals. But again, these clinics, they're not cheap. My visit cost about $5,000. Some of these longevity clinics offer services throughout the entire year, though. That can go for $60,000 or more. A lot of it is not covered by insurance, so always ask ahead of time. Now we turn to another hot topic, anti-gray hair products. According to Advanced Dermatology, 30% of Americans say they spend the most money on their hair color. It can be tempting to try a product that promises to reduce or delay gray hair, but do they really work? Call it 50 shades of anti-gray. One of the hottest hair care trends for those looking to hold back the hands of time. I recently found this gray hair treatment. We're hoping for the best. It's supposed to go deep into the scalp to the bulb and restore the hair color. All you have to do is target your gray areas. Some sharing their experience on social media, trying popular serums and supplements, promising to delay the gray. This is what it looks like. I'm also not ready. You just apply it kind of in lines. For any salt with my pepper. Feels nice. If anything, I'm at least getting a scalp massage. With 6 to 23% of the world's population showing at least 50% gray hair coverage by age 50, in the past year, search interest in anti-gray hair serum climbing 280% in the U.S. alone. We just have to kind of accept some facts of life, and gray hair is one of them. Dr. Mona Gohara is a board-certified dermatologist. What causes gray hair? We're all born with a certain number of hair follicles and a predetermined number of hair follicle cycles. There are little pigment-producing factories in our hair follicles called melanocytes that give us our hair color. Sometimes the melanocytes get tired. They just don't want to work anymore. And that's when our hair turns gray. She says anti-gray products aim to stimulate those melanocytes. Do they work? Can I make a joke and say it's kind of in the gray zone? <laughs> Whether the melanocytes are actually nudged is questionable. I don't know that we have any definitive science to say that that's actually happening. One well-known plant-based serum containing ingredients like caffeine, peptides, and vitamins promises to deliver real, visible results in as soon as 90 days. According to its website, the company behind the serum bases the statement on a three-month clinical study of 15 participants, of which 64% reported seeing less gray hair. For best results, the brand also recommends using its Gray Delay Supplement, a blend of vitamins, antioxidants, minerals, and botanicals, described as ideal for those with little to no gray hair. While the Food and Drug Administration does not review anti-gray hair products for safety before they hit the market, Ohara considers them low risk for side effects, which could include irritation from serums or gastrointestinal issues with supplements. They're pretty safe, and that's why I think it's okay to try it on a small area.
but she says check with your doctor before trying them. While prices vary per product, serum and supplement combos can cost $70 to $140, with most brands offering a discounted price when you sign up for a monthly subscription. Gohara says before spending your money, look to the root of the problem. It is 100% about our genetics. Now, there are other things that can give us gray hair, Vicky. There are some- Like my kids. That, yeah, oh, definitely. Your teenagers. <laughs> In a statement to NBC News, Vegamore says their serum helps reduce the appearance of grays on new hair growth, and their supplement helps preserve the hair's natural pigment and delays grays. All right, coming up, think twice before posting photos online. The unintended consequences of a photo post. We are back with a warning about photo fakes as more of us rely on online connections professionally and personally. How do you know who you're really talking to? Is that profile picture the real person? It's a problem that's becoming more common. Here are the red flags you need to watch for. How many of you have been threatened by someone who's upset thinking they know you? All of you. They're young, they're good looking, and they're on social media. Kayla, Cami, Tristan, and Justin say scammers have stolen their images to create fake online profiles and then use those profiles to lure people into online relationships, grooming them into sending money. I had a family contact me and they wanted me to inform their grandfather like that it wasn't me that he was talking to. Is this something you have to deal with every day? Yeah, 100%. All say their photos now live on hundreds, even thousands of fake social media profiles, many times using their real names. I've actually been contacted by like the FBI, NCIS, basically confirming that I'm not behind all of this. These women, they spend thousands of dollars thinking I'm going to come see them. Justin says he saw a post online, a woman celebrating her engagement to him. He messaged her and warned her husband to be wasn't real. Then the scammer saw Justin's comment. The scammer calls me and he's like, you're messing with my business. And I'm like, it's my face. This is not your business. Justin recorded the call. Oh, everybody but this poor girl, right? What did you say? Well, no. Tristan, a fitness coach, says some women who thought they were having an online relationship with him even hired him for in-person training. They just want to confirm that it's actually me, and then they'll just waste my time. Cybercrime continues to rise in America. Last year, reports of romance scams alone amounted to a reported loss of $1.3 billion. Among the top lies used to ask for money, someone close is sick, hurt, or in jail, and I am in the military. Three of these four have served or are serving. I think that military personnel are targeted because you can use the excuse because of security concerns. I can't send you a picture right now. I'm not allowed to video chat. California-based Social Catfish is a people search engine that focuses on online safety. 
Their search results help customers find and remove fake profiles. The internet's still the wild, wild west. There are very few laws to protect you online for the use of your images. CEO David McClellan says these stolen images can lead to very real danger. I had people actually showing up and, you know, getting getting upset with me in person. And it's even happened to me. Vicky, we decided to run your image and here's what we found. We found a Vicky Wind channel selling for $799. We also found a clubhouse link of somebody actually using your image to most likely talk to other people online. And we found a celebrity foot website that has all your feet pics. My feet? That is gross and weird. McClellan says you can take steps to protect your images. Set your social media profiles to private. Limit what you post. Add watermarks to your photos and run reverse image searches. It's free with Google Images. If you can't meet the person within like a week, it's not real. By the way, those websites that were found with my pictures, Social Catfish has helped me take those down. And a few good reminders, never send money to someone you haven't met. Anytime someone online asks you for money, stop contact with them immediately and report that to the FTC. Artificial intelligence technology is also making it easier for scammers. A simple phone call is all it takes to extort money. The FBI says on average, victims of schemes using new voice technology lose about $11,000 each and recently scams have reached a new level with AI clones that look and sound like real celebrities spreading fake messages online. Today we are launching an investment project that From Elon Musk pitching an investment opportunity to Gail King promoting a weight loss product. Follow the link right now and learn more about my secret. It seems fake ads made with AI are everywhere. Even Tom Hanks has found himself an unwilling spokesperson, warning his Instagram followers, there's a video out there promoting some dental plan with an AI version of me. I have nothing to do with it. While celebrity endorsement scams are nothing new, in the age of AI, these deceitful deep fakes are becoming more convincing, fooling those who buy into them. The FBI says last year victims lost a record $10.2 billion to scams and other online crimes. With just a few seconds of audio, new artificial intelligence software can clone a person's voice. As an actor, I pretend for a living. As an actor, I pretend for a living. And a scammer can make it say anything. The Federal Trade Commission issuing a recent warning that voice cloning technology is making family emergency scams more convincing. Earlier this year, several Oregon school districts warned parents about a spate of fake kidnapping calls. A recent global survey showed one in four people saying they've experienced an AI voice cloning scam or knew someone who had. I got a phone call from an unknown number. And so I pick up the phone and I say hello. And my daughter Brianna says, Mom, and she's crying and sobbing. Jennifer DeStefano says she was convinced her 15 year old daughter Brianna had been kidnapped. And uh, she says, Mom, these bad men have me. Help me, help me, help me. She fades off as a man takes over the phone and says, Listen here, I've got your daughter. She says the scammer threatened to harm her daughter unless she sent him a million dollars. How much did it sound like your daughter? It sounded, I never doubted it was her. I, I had a full conversation with her. It was the way she cries, it was the way she sobs, it was the way she would respond to me. Jennifer was able to connect with her husband who confirmed Brianna was safe. After warning her friends and neighbors, Jennifer says she's heard of similar incidents. Whether it was a kidnapping, whether it was an accident, you know, they were in jail, all these different types of scenarios. We're going to have a completely new group of scammers and threat actors. Wasim Khalid is CEO and co-founder of Blackbird AI. I saw that in some of these voice cloning programs are as cheap as $5 a month, and you can take someone's voice off of a social media video, use AI, and make that voice say whatever you want it to do. Is that really happening? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's basically the, the revolution in AI over the last six months. The key takeaway here is generative AI is going to be the catalyst to drive misinformation, disinformation, and warped realities further and faster than we've ever seen before. He says if you get a suspicious call about a family emergency, first authenticate the person by having them confirm information only you two would know. Have a private safe word for your family and have someone else call your loved one's actual phone number. Because with AI, what you see and hear 
is not always what you get. Up next, a new Uber feature that allows teens to order their own rides. Consumer Confidential continues right after the break. Popular rideshare Uber has a new feature that could make things a lot easier for busy parents. Have you ever had a child stuck at school while you're at work and unable to pick them up? Introducing Uber for Teens. Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome to what we're sure will be our greatest year at Rydell. As classic as the movie Grease, so is the ritual of returning to class. And with it comes hectic teen schedules. School, sports practice, band, even going to the mall. Solving the riddle of all those rides can be worse than a wordle. I should know, my own teenage daughter Emerson is as busy as ever. So we're trying out Uber for Teens. It's a new service that allows teens to order their own rides. It starts here on my phone in the Uber app. Teens can actually create an account on their own. A parent or guardian has to invite them. So you go to your Uber app, hit account, and then family and teens, Right there, invite family, and there it is, add a teen. The app, designed for teens 13 to 17, sends Emerson an invite, and from there, she creates her own teen account after reading a safety tutorial. Uber says parents should talk to their teens before they use the service, remind them to check the license plate, ask the driver who they're picking up before getting in, and never sit in the front seat. I'm ordering my ride now. Here I am at work and I just got a text. Yep, it's a notification. It says Emerson just requested a ride and the driver is arriving in four minutes. The car pulls up. Hey, how are you? Who are you here for? Um, Emerson. Yep, yeah, all right. But the driver can't start the ride without a personal identification number or PIN from Emerson's app to ensure she's in the right car. We will have uh, one uh, PIN for me. The PIN is Six, two, five, five. She's on her way while I follow along from my office. It shows me Emerson's been picked up and it shows me she'll be dropped off in seven minutes. I can even call the driver to check in. Is Emerson in the car with you? Yes, ma'am. She is here. Great. Is everything going okay? Everything perfect, ma'am. Just perfect. Hey, Emerson, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Everything's good on your end? Going great. Uber says drivers with teen passengers can't change drop-off locations, and if the drive goes off course or stops for extended periods of time, Uber will call the driver and teen, and if necessary, 911. 
Uber Vice President Sachin Kansal notes the safety features are mandatory and cannot be turned off. Our kids are very precious cargo. For parents, the most important thing was visibility and tracking. Can any driver drive teens or do they have to go through a vetting process? They have to be an experienced driver on our platform and they have to be positively rated throughout. In addition, Uber says it conducts criminal background checks and reviews driving records every year, providing a new option for busy parents just in time for the start of school. Thanks for the ride. We also tried the new Uber Eats feature for teens multiple times, but we did experience a few glitches from not getting notifications to receiving the wrong order. Uber tells us that this feature is still being tested and developed. Coming up, the latest housing trend. What to know about build to rent communities that are popping up across the country. Imagine living in a three or four bedroom home, two car garage and a backyard without all the responsibilities of home ownership. Introducing build to rent communities, entire neighborhoods of single family homes built just for renting. They're popping up across the country and they're already helping to alleviate the national housing shortage. The American dream isn't for sale, it's for rent in this community near Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to Harmony Heights, 153 and four bedroom single family homes, all brand new and part of the build to rent trend. Renters enjoy modern appliances and luxury finishes, spacious closets and smart home technology. An app allows them to request fixes. Their monthly rent and a small fee cover all maintenance and landscaping. Think of an apartment complex, except you break it down into single family homes. Richard Ross is CEO of Quinn Residences. Who is renting these homes? A third of our residents are people who can't come up with a down payment. They can't afford seven, seven and a half percent mortgage today. But two thirds of our residents are residents by choice, meaning they elect to rent. While the median sales price for existing homes has dropped nearly 2% from last year, a recent report shows renting as more cost effective than home ownership in 95% of the U.S. right now. Here in the United States, there are almost a thousand of these build to rent communities with single family detached homes. More than 500 are in the works. Each community has 50 or more homes renting for an average of $2,000 a month. Well, I never even heard of a community that was strictly a rental community. So I was pretty intrigued by it. Luke and Rebecca Montgomery spent a year looking to buy a home, but struggled to find anything within their price range and big enough for their family. Then they found this neighborhood on Zillow. This is not the time to buy or, or build. We rather wait it out a little bit and see what happens. So this was just the right solution for us. How nice is it to have the benefits of home ownership without the responsibility. It's nice to be able to know that in the event something happens, it's not all gonna fall on your shoulders. I can find myself very bored. I don't have to cut the grass. Empty nesters Marco and Myra Martinez says the low maintenance lifestyle gives them more time to enjoy the things they love. I love to hear the birds uh, singing and to see the trees uh, behind my house. It's beautiful. 
a career change prompting their move from Texas. The couple says instead of buying, they decided to rent so they could see if they liked the area first. This community offered us a, a great opportunity to rent a house where we feel safe. You don't have to own all the time. I mean, you can make the decision of renting and, and, and thinking about it, and sometimes that's better than just uh, owning. You can use an online calculator like one of these to see if it makes sense for you to rent or buy in a particular location. People are taking a different path to home ownership. David Howard, CEO of the National Rental Home Council, says Build to Rent provides an innovative way to introduce supply into the housing market, which is an estimated 6 million homes short. What does it mean when it comes to affordability? It is almost $1,000 less expensive on average to rent a single family home than to make a mortgage payment on a single family home. When considering Build to Rent, experts say do your homework. Look for reputable developers. You can search those affiliated with the National Rent Home Council at buildforrenthomes.com. Also, think about location and if the community matches your family's lifestyle. Tips to help you lay the foundation for your version of the American dream. That is our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. The hills are alive with the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on. It's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do, diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs> My name is Amy Traverso, and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, 
colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England, as they say on the boat, they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. Back in you know the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. Two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time. They were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great-great-grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted, but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington State could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. Apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't going to get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just going to make a nice pie. <laughs> Now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples, and that's it. Where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago, and that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily, and I got a chance to give it a try, or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves. I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid-20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall.
There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> My family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler and you're thinking about like comforts at home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. Labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. Okay. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. Okay. Right next to it is some Macintosh apples. Okay. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes it comes Just free. Like that. So that means that it's ripe, okay? And the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. So we, we treat these like eggs and oh, we place them in place the bucket. Place them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the Honeycrisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was gonna look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about, okay, are you gonna come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this'll be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together.
American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all-American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers, and our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells the story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it, and she would bake it in the oven just along with hers, and I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. Funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies, and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. Once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity. She just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. I honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old, proving it's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. It's the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. It's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough, so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of uh, flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hands. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name is Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody loved them.
Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. Is the best boss. No, everything I do is very, how would Liz want it, want it done? Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May. But her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> No, it's very, uh, it's very special. I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations. make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by K. K. Thank y'all. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy, candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And then when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, I wanted him to have gold candy apples as a favor. We found someone to make them. And then she encouraged me, you know, you can make these yourself. You can do this yourself. Wanting to enjoy candy apples year round, Kim began developing unique candy recipes at home. Her kids, her first taste testers. Eventually, it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream full time. There's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples and you, love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought, 
apples. That would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in candy apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely going to support it. It's going to become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmer's markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating. And it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dip treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival, the turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans, is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. We have five kids ranging uh, ages 2 to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was apple. <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim, owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process, and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from, from her. And then my mom, working the store, um, she was actually washing apples as well. She's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on. Last year, last April, uh, my mother-in-law passed away. And after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family. And so two weeks later, my mom passed. And we weren't expecting that of you know either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by. That we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, love, and passion. You know, a great job managing both. 
apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. Good morning, guys. Welcome to The Boost. The New York City Marathon is coming up on Sunday, and we will be cheering on all the runners, but especially our very own Chanel Jones. It will be her very first marathon. And with the big day almost here, she's meeting members of the running community who are inspiring her to cross that finish line. Among them, the social media star known as the running interviewer. Hey! 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 How many miles are you running today? 3.5 miles. I'm just going to do two. One to two, little warm up. Well, if you let me join you, I'll get you any pair of sneakers. Let's go! Come on! She's known to her hundreds of thousands of followers as the running interviewer. Kate Max is on the move. But today, we're flipping the script, and she's taking it in stride. Hey, how many miles are you running today? I'm just enjoying Central Park. Well, if you run two miles with me today, I will feature you on the Today Show. On the Today Show? All right, let's go. Oh, yay! <laughs> let's do Kate's social media series features conversations with celebrities and online creators while working up a sweat. Have you always loved running? Yeah, running's been a big part of my life for the past 10 years. And growing up in North Jersey, I was always playing sports. And what I loved about being on a team was really the social and fun aspect. So when I got into running, I really wanted to take that community feel with me. And I've just always enjoyed running with other people. Kate says running was there for her at a time when she really needed it. I was in high school and I was competitively playing a sport and I was on track to go to college for it. And then I tore my ACL, not once, but twice. Oh, wow. It's tough, you know, because I was on crutches for two months. And I remember being able to walk, do the elliptical, and then start running. I was like, this is amazing. Like, I never want to not be able to run wow. again. Kate studied marketing and communications at Fordham University before starting her career working in advertising. All the while, she kept pace with her passion, running the Philadelphia Marathon in 2019 and the New York City Marathon in 2021. So I was always just around creativity, and for me, social media always was my creative outlet. In the spring of 2023, Kate posted her first on-the-go interview. It received over 100,000 views on TikTok. Then I was like, okay, I'm not going to think anything of this because this could be a fluke. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. So Kate hit the ground running. She's interviewed dozens of run buddies, racking up millions of views online with the goal of inspiring people to stop scrolling and start moving. I love that you interview us normal folks and then you yeah. also interview celebrities. Who have been some of the big ones? I've ran with Vinny from the Jersey Shore. I've ran with David Kilgore, who is a Red Bull extreme athlete. I've ran with Chelsea Cutler, who is one of my all time favorite artists and singers. And I always listen to Chelsea's music when I'm running. We ended the video in her studio with her performing a song for me. And I was like, is this real life? That's awesome. <laughs> Kate's advice, it's really about taking that first step. What would you say to someone who, even if it's just for 10 minutes a day, just getting outside and exercising or moving a little bit, how would you encourage someone? Because this can feel intimidating. Running really can feel intimidating. And what I aim to do is show people that, you know, running and doing an activity can be fun and it can also be social. And I get so many comments and messages every day from people being like, I joined a run club because of you, or I started running, or, you know, I tried yoga for the first time because of you. And I think that's really cool. Nothing is 100%. No. But for the most part, you never regret it when you're done. I've never seen anybody <laughs> frown at the end of a run or a power walk. You yeah. just can't. <laughs> no, you can't. It's always hard during it, but after you get those endorphins are flowing and you feel good. <laughs> Content creating is now Kate's full-time job and the miles ahead look promising. So tell me, I know you always end your interviews asking your runners if there's a quote that they live by. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you the same thing. Is there a quote that you live by? I gotta shout out my mom, because I know. Mom. <laughs> Hi mom, I know you're watching. So growing up, she always said carpe diem and yeah, seize the day. Seize the day. <laughs> seize the day. Seize the day. <laughs> okay, we're at two miles. Woo! Thank you so much, Kate, for running oh, with me. Thank you. What a yeah. so good. Now to a group of students gaining confidence through running. They're part of a running program that's changing lives by helping kids build physical and mental strength. 
Donna Farah is in the laced up her sneakers and headed to Philly to share a big surprise with these young athletes. Take a look. Sponsored by Brooks. Run happy. In the hallways of schools across Philadelphia, one uniform stands out. You ready for the 5K races? But these aren't your average varsity jackets. These blue shirts and sweaters are worn by students who have run a half or full marathon. All thanks to a local nonprofit, Students Run Philly Style. They get their hoodies and they get to have that moment where they go, yes, I accomplished something big. The kid I ran the marathon with this year wore that hoodie to school for the entire next week. It's a passion project for running coach Jeremy Spry, who serves as a program manager for a local high school and volunteers with the organization. I look for students who may not see themselves as traditional athletes, who know they want something to be a part of a team. Students Run Philly Style provides each student with free shoes, gear, and training to help build their physical and mental stamina and reach more personal goals. Students like 10th grader Willis Osorio. What made you want to start? When I was younger, I was like really scared of showing myself in like athletic events. In gym class, I'd always like hide in a corner. It was through Students Run that got me into physical activity. His classmate Gus Wood felt the same way. I moved to a new middle school and uh, I was very shy and I wouldn't really talk to people. I'm a lot better at making new relationships, making new friends because of running. A goal at the heart of the program, providing a safe and inclusive space for students. It's not necessarily rewarding somebody for being the fastest. It's our jobs to celebrate each other. It's our jobs to make sure that no one gets left behind and so having that teamwork, having that family is just so, so important. Marathoners Brissa de la Cruz Tadeo, a high school senior, and Chris Zhang, a sophomore, are both part of one of the LGBTQ plus chapters of the organization. I used to be like a really insecure person. After I started running, I started to focus on myself, my own improvement. Being in that space is really helpful in building up my confidence and like being more open and out, just like unapologetically. I really don't see students run as a sport. I feel like it's more of a lifestyle. We're fortunate enough to have a program where we're seen and valued. Students Run Philly Style currently has 55 chapters and reaches 1,000 kids, making a big impact. 41% of students have increased their GPA and 91% of 12th graders graduated high school. All right, go ahead. We invited runners from chapters across Philly to come together to a special practice. Go students run Philly style! Woo! With a big surprise at the finish line. On the count of three, we're gonna lift this up, okay? One, two, three! Woo! Our sponsor, Brooks Running, is donating over 150 pairs of shoes part of their ongoing commitment to supporting young runners and running groups across the country, our sponsor, Brooks Running, is donating $10,000 to Students Run Philly what? Style. That is so awesome! Woo! That How is does that make you feel? So amazing. That money will go so far for all of these kids and for so many more kids in Philadelphia. Students Run Philly Style!
We are back on the boost, gearing up for the New York City Marathon and getting ready to cheer on our girl, Chanel. So ahead of the race, Chanel has been taking us inside her training and sharing why she decided to tackle such a massive challenge for the very first time. Running around is a mainstay of my day at work, at home, and even more with my kids. Running as a sport, though, that's new territory. I did not like gym class with the kids. I hated the monkey bars. I hated field day, all of that stuff. But I love a challenge, and this one's a biggie. And I'm saying, OK, you know what, Chanel? You didn't like it because it was hard. So now you need to take your 45-year-old self and do something that is really challenging. The New York City Marathon. All 26 miles, something I never imagined I'd attempt, even in my wildest dreams. So when I first started doing this, I just thought I would go outside and practice sometimes. I never really thought about really what it takes to prepare for a marathon. For help, I enlisted Nike running coach Jess Woods, who's done 18 ultra marathons. Jess has been a godsend, so she'll send me a schedule for the week. What I've learned is, Running isn't always just running. Some days you may just run for 30 minutes. Other days you'll run for a longer amount of time. But the goal is to get to 26 miles. Jess introduced me to the concept of prehab, an assessment to help improve your form and get ahead of any potential injury. There are no tubes, there are no cords. It's all cameras. And using those cameras and syncing them with the treadmill, they're able to analyze your gait, how you're running, where you're putting your weight your posture, and you're graded on your performance. And I got a C the first time. I don't get C's. I had to lean forward a little more. I had to improve my cadence. Just tweaking a few of those things, running a little bit more forward, got me from a C to a B. Initially, five miles seemed like crazy town. So now, when I'm aiming for 12 on the weekend, five doesn't seem so bad. To get those endorphins flowing, Jess and I always start. Oh. Yeah? Yes. With a warm up. Quick. Pop, pop. This is nice that we're at a track today. Yeah. Because we're usually just trying to find a quiet space on the plaza. Exactly. Today's goal speed work so that my marathon pace stays consistent. This can be faster than your marathon pace now. Okay. We want you to get tired. Okay. Because then you're going to try and find that marathon pace again. After. On tired legs. Ooh, okay. All right. Doing it. So it feels hard, but not impossible. Right. Okay. Yes. And 203 for that lap. Seriously, who am I? Like, who am I right now? Ultimately, it's about a lot more than just running. A lot of us have things that we've always wanted to do and life gets in the way. So I am hoping that if I do this, that it will maybe trigger something in you to maybe do something as well. Um, because I think together we can do hard things. All right, let's do it. And while I still have two more months and many, many miles ahead of me, I'm grateful for how far I've come. Three, two, woo! Perfect! Get nice there. job! Woo <laughs> Marathon pace after some hard intervals. Progress. Yeah, that's more than a little bit of progress. That oh was awesome. Goodness. Nicely done. Yay. Thank Woo. you. Before Chanel hits the streets of New York, she went for an unforgettable run in Philly with a group of runners taking in murals while on the move. The murals in Philadelphia, they tell the stories of where we come from. And I think there's a natural connection between the strength and resilience that you see in those stories with athleticism and running and fitness as well. In the city of brotherly love, the murals are hard to miss. With over 4,000 public works of art, Philadelphia is known as the mural capital of the world. It's the backdrop for Mural Miles, a nonprofit organization that combines fitness and art. Craig Oppenheimer started the group after a run with some friends in 2021. Tell me what you think it is about running and art and fitness. Like, how does it all kind of fit together in your mind? We run past these murals all the time, and we don't stop to take a moment to learn who the artist was or learn the backstory about it. We go on group runs, we visit murals, and it's an art education and fitness experience all in one. I joined Craig and nearly 40 people for my first group run. Let's give it up for Chanel. Every 
month, members lace up their sneakers, posting their routes and mural stops on social media, inviting all ages, all levels, all for free. I like the opportunity to get to meet some of the artists who create these murals. It's a very diverse group, all different ages, all, everybody is from different places. What is it about running that you love? It makes uh. me feel that I can accomplish things, even though sometimes I think that I cannot do it. With every run, Mural Miles hopes to inspire people through movement and the art that's become unique to this city. For people who aren't from Philadelphia, why are the murals so special to this city? For people who are really proud of the murals that are in the neighborhood, they are a catalyst for change. They help make neighborhoods safer um, and more of a enjoyable place to to be. Artists like Eric Oakday and David Gwynn are hitting the pavement too. And what does it feel like as an artist to receive this kind of support? You have a sense that people will see it, but you, you're gone. And so to have a group bring 100 people by your work, it's, it's amazing. Running with the group has been incredible. It's just a wonderful community. I'm not a runner and I've never run with a group. So do you think it helps when you're with a group we're all kind of, you know, around the same purpose. If you're surrounded by people who are doing the exact same thing and are encouraging, it's an amazing opportunity to do something like that. All right, thank you guys for coming out. Today we're gonna run two miles. We're gonna stop at four murals. Before we got started, the group turned the questions on me. Why do you think Philadelphia is the best city in the world? <laughs> Philadelphia is honest. They love hard. This is a very special place, so I wouldn't try for it here. <laughs> The organization is also giving back by curating more art for the city, like this mural that kicked off our run. So this mural is called Equilibrium by Eric Oakday, 2022. Equilibrium is a mural reflecting the theme of movement, both literally and figuratively. Okay, let's run. Yeah. Autumn Revisited by David Gwynn, 2013. Yeah. You get a cheesesteak after this. Convergence by Andrea Grasso, 2021. Finally, our last mural stop. So this is another one of David's murals. Give it up. For these runners, Mural Miles has helped them find more than fitness and art. They found community. This was awesome. Welcome back to The Boost. We have a truly inspiring story for you. It's about an incredible woman who refused to give up on doing what she loves. When her passion for running was nearly taken away, she found her own unique way to keep going. Once again, Chanel has her story. For many people, running is as simple as putting one foot in front of the other. 
For Justine Galloway, the best path forward is in reverse, as in running backwards. People always call me show off, and they always say um, you're running the wrong way, which I've heard plenty of times. Justine has been running all her life, mainly forwards, inspired by her dad, Jim. My dad actually ran his first marathon the year I was born, New York City Marathon. When I was growing up, he would be training for marathons, and when he would finish his marathon, I'd run around the block with him. What is it about running that you love? One is the connection to my dad, and I just, I saw when it got taken away from him, it's like everyone can run. A Parkinson's diagnosis ended her dad's running career, but it jump-started hers. I continue to run. I ran through high school, kind of, he lived vicariously through me. When Justine's father passed away in 2010, she found solace in the sport and would go on to complete nine marathons. But at 31 years old, while running her third Boston Marathon, she started to feel something strange. I got to mile 18 and was just feeling really off. Two weeks later, I took a fall. And then right after that, my running significantly changed. When you first realized, like, wait a minute, I can't do what I love, what did that feel like? It was really difficult. My left leg wouldn't listen to my brain. It was like my left leg was a piece of wood and it wouldn't move with my body. And so it would either stay up in the air or go to the side and it just wouldn't plant when I wanted it to plant and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Justine saw multiple orthopedic specialists and neurologists. She finally got an answer two years later focal dystonia. Writers can get it who all of a sudden can't write. Musicians, pianists who can't play a song they've always played their whole life will get it. Through physical therapy, Justine found that running backwards was painless. She sprinted into this new chapter, training with a running club and friends who would spot her. In the process, she earned two Guinness World Records for running a half marathon backwards. Well, here I was running backwards a half marathon with my brother and my sister and doing what I love. Justine then decided to try the seemingly impossible, complete the New York City Marathon. I can't even imagine. How do you do the New York City Marathon backwards? It was amazing, it was phenomenal running. Arizona, it was the coolest thing ever to see 50,000 people running after you. She ran for the Michael J. Fox Foundation in honor of her dad. And then this monumental moment, the actor spotted her during the race. At first I thought maybe it was my brother because I was like, okay, I'm just going to lean on to you. And then I realized it was Michael J. Fox. And he, you know, gave me encouragement to move on. Running has taken a whole new meaning for Justine. She no longer runs for time, but instead for fun. So it sounds like you're not going to seek treatment. No. My dad being in and out of hospitals, I just wanted a diagnosis, so I knew it was what I could name it, and then I wanted to continue with my life. Changing course allowed Justine not only to conquer new milestones, but find a new way to continue looking ahead. Keep trying and keep going forward and keep moving. Like, don't let anything stop you, and nothing is impossible. While training for last year's New York City Marathon, two runners found friendship in a profound and unexpected way. Savannah shines a light on the life-saving moment that brought them together. I consider myself a lucky person, but this was remarkable. <laughs> In the fall of 2019, John Harvey's good fortune was about to be put to the test. A surgeon at New York's Mount Sinai Morningside Hospital, he was on a training run in Central Park. His wife, Helena, was cheering him on at mile 15. He ran by, he gave me a kiss, I gave him the banana, and he went on his way. I walked over to the finish line and I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and he didn't appear. Helena had no idea her husband had collapsed just moments after seeing her. Also out running that day, Sauni Pereira, another physician at Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. I came upon a runner who was collapsed on the side of the running path. I started ventilating the patient. Another police officer arrived with a defibrillator. We put the device on the patient. It noted that we should deliver a shock. We did. His hand landed on his chest. I saw his wedding ring, and I immediately thought, this guy is married. He probably has kids. 
My next memory was opening my eyes and looking straight up at the sky with a circle of people looking down at me and looking really excited and happy. Resuscitated, Harvey was rushed to a nearby hospital. He had gone into cardiac arrest. Tests would reveal it was the result of a congenital heart condition and he would ultimately undergo open heart surgery. But there was still a missing piece. He called me and he said, are you, are you the person that helped? resuscitate me and I said yes I am you know it was it was as special to me as it maybe was for him this was the beginning of a really lovely friendship this weekend the friends will take on a special challenge running the New York City Marathon together step by step Sony is very much like a superhero she's super fast and she saves lives Sony is gonna very kindly slow down so that we can run together their fortunate friendship extending far beyond Marathon Sunday. I consider myself an extremely lucky person. Being saved after an event like this, it's like winning the lottery. It truly is. Wow. What a story, and Sony and John are with us this morning. Doctors, good morning to you. Are you guys ready for the marathon? Absolutely. We're ready. We're yeah. excited. What has this meant to you, John, to have this friendship and, and form this bond with Sony? Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's just such a wonderful thing. And Sony did such an amazing thing that day, and uh, she saved my life. I mean, what more can I say? I'm still here for my family, my patients, and, um, and now we have a wonderful friendship as well. Welcome back to The Boost. We have one more video that is going to brighten your day. Check it out. Sometimes it's so easy to take the little things in life for granted. That is until you see someone else's perspective. So watch what happens when a man from Uganda, who now lives in Canada, sees snow for the very first time. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, so happy to see the snow my first time. This is the real snow. <laughs> it looks beautiful, it's so white. Oh, oh my god. I'm so happy. Oh. Later, yeah. later he says, nice, nice to, to meet you. you. <laughs> he said that to the snow. Peter moved to Canada over the summer. He's excited oh about the snow. You know what? Like it's nice soft. when someone sees some, something for the first time. Like, we should avoid the yellow snow. Oh. <laughs> oh, pal. And that's all for us for today. We hope we were able to start your day off with a smile, maybe inspire you to do something great, maybe even run your own marathon. Of course, the best of luck to our girl Chanel as she runs her very first marathon this weekend, and we will be cheering her on. We'll see you next time with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day.
I'm Shop Today Editorial Director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in Editor's Picks. I'm Shop All Day contributor Makon Jovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media and influencer trends. And I'm lifestyle expert Erica Domasek. I'm here with products and projects you can buy to DIY. The best part is anyone can do this. This is Shop All Day Home Refresh. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Adriana Brock and today we are sharing items we found to upgrade and refresh your home on a budget. From a simple product that makes your faucet touch free to an elegant baking dish that goes seamlessly from the oven to the table. And see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You guys know what to do. Use the camera on your smartphone to scan it right now for instant access to all of the products on the show today. So let's get to it. Okay, now that fall is finally here, I have the perfect oven dish for you guys. It's from Joanna Gaines's Target line, Hearth and Hand with Magnolia. So of course she thought of a beautiful designed piece for the kitchen that's also really versatile. So what this does, it lets you take your cooking from the oven to the dining table to make it easy to serve the whole family. I love this dish, it's so beautiful, it's really large, so you can make a full meal for the family in it. And it comes with this beautiful stand with these wooden handles, and all you do is you pop it in, and then you could literally take it to the table and serve the whole family. And if you're having a dinner party, you can also use it as a salad dish to serve your guests. This is an incredible, versatile piece that you're gonna want in the kitchen this season. Another must have in the kitchen is this immersion blender. We love it at today.com. It is a handheld one. So you use it in place of your bulky blender and it's so affordable. I love this thing. It comes with three interchangeable attachments so you can blend, whisk and froth it all. I'm talking everything from blending up soups to mixing batter and the brand says that you can even crush ice in the morning to make your smoothie on the go or froth some milk to make a cappuccino or hot chocolate for the kids. It is a kitchen workhorse that does all the work for you without taking up a bunch of counter space. Cleaning it is so easy. All you have to do is detach the attachments, throw them in the dishwasher and you're good to go. So this next one I recently bought for my home because I had a paper towel holder that was way too small for those large paper towel rolls that I've been buying. So this is a small kitchen upgrade that can make all the difference. It's such an inconvenience when you have your paper towel roll, your hands are dirty and you just need the perfect size tear. This one from OXO is really great because it has a spring-loaded arm right here and it fits different size rolls no matter how thick or thin. It's got a gripped attachment right here that's gonna keep it in place. And then the base is actually weighted, so it gives it stability. And then when you're busy in the kitchen, whether you're cooking or the kids are running around, it's gonna give you the perfect one-handed tear each time. So no more unraveling rolls or messy tears. It's one of those small inconveniences you never thought about, but now that I have something like this, I don't know how I live without it. And if you've ever wanted to upgrade your faucet with one of those touchless versions, here's a really affordable solution for under $40. It is a motion sensor faucet, and you can upgrade the faucet that you already have with this. So what it does is it comes with this adapter that you put over your existing faucet. So all you have to do is unscrew it, you take out the aerator, you add a filter in, and then you use a wrench to put it on. And you're gonna see there's a motion sensor in the front and in the bottom. This is so great when you're cooking and you need to quickly rinse your produce, you need to wash your hands, or you have little ones running around the house. This is awesome because they can wash their hands. You don't have to worry about wasting water or leaving the water running on accident. And the brand says that one charge of these can last for up to nine months. So super easy to use, very user-friendly, affordable, and great for saving water. But one thing to know is that you're gonna wanna check the compatibility chart on the website to make sure that it fits your faucet at home. And moving into the living room, if you are binge watching TV, you need one of these couch coasters. It is such a game changer. It's basically a weighted cup holder that goes over your couch or your recliner's armrest. It gives you easy access to your drink, and it's great if you don't have an end table nearby on one side of the couch. It has a non-slip silicone arm that goes over each part of the rest, and it gives it stability. What's really cool about this too is that it has a slip for a mug, or you can use one of the cool adapters that comes with it, so you can fit cans. 
The brand says you could fit bottles, mugs, cups, anything, you name it. It's such a game changer. You're gonna want it on your couch all season long, and it's just $25. And moving into the bathroom, we found a super affordable, high pressure shower head that's gonna transform your sacred shower time in the morning. Sometimes the shower is the only place I can get some peace and quiet. So with the shower head that's super affordable, you get strong pressure, steady water flow, and wide coverage area, and it's a standard size. You can't beat the price on this, and the brand says that installation is actually pretty easy. You don't really need tools, just a little bit of muscle and some plumber's tape that's included. Plus, it comes in three different finishes from chrome to brushed nickel and black. Okay, and this last one is awesome. I never knew I would want a stone mat until I tried this one. So shout out to my husband for introducing it to me. And it is truly an upgrade from our old bath mat. So let me introduce you to the Sutera stone bath mat. It's made with diatomaceous earth, which is known to be a great... I've watched it literally absorb water before my eyes. And you don't have to worry about washing it. I love this thing. And it does come with a little sanding paper, which is really nice. You use it every few months to keep it nice and clean and refresh the stone, but it does last for a while. I've had mine right now for about two to three years. All right, let's run through the products one more time. The oven to table baking dish, the immersion blender, the paper towel holder, the couch coaster, the touchless faucet adapter, the high pressure shower head, and the stone bath mat. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for Editor's Picks. Up next, McCohen Lobu is talking to author and organizing expert, Janelle Cohen. She's gonna share some of her favorite go-to items to keep every shelf and closet in your home flawlessly tidy. Don't go away. Hi there, welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code at the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. 
Today, we're talking all about our homes and how to not only keep them cozy and clean, but also perfectly organized. I'm excited to have author and organizing expert Janelle Cohen joining us to share her favorite ways to keep your home organized, plus the products to help you do it. Hi, Janelle. How are you? Hi, thanks so much for having me. Oh, we are so excited that you're here. You are an organizing expert. Let's talk about how you got started. So I actually got started because my mom has this amazing walk-in pantry and it just wasn't maximized. And I was like, you know what would be a great Mother's Day gift? I'm going to go on Pinterest. I'm going to redo my mom's pantry for her. I always have been very organized and I redid it for her for Mother's Day. I took before and afters and then I posted them on Facebook because I was like really proud of myself. I thought I did a great job. That was five years ago now. Wow. And you've had quite the journey. So when it comes to organizing and I'm looking at my house or people watching, looking at their house, what do you start with? The big project or do you attack the smaller project first? So I think it's really important. I like to share with my clients that they can do it themselves. There's always going to be a spot where we have clutter. You figure out a solution based on your habits. We yeah. have things that we naturally do. So I always say work with them rather than against them, rather than being like, oh, I just, I always take my shoes off here and there's always <laughs> shoes and it's so annoying. Right. Be nicer to yourself and be like, this is where I take my shoes off. So I'm going to put a shoe rack. So let's say we're attacking a corner for five minutes. We have items that we have emotional ties to. And sometimes it's hard to just kind of purge guilt free. So what advice do you have for people when we're trying to purge and feel good about what we're purging? I always say that when it comes to sentimental attachment, sometimes you have to close your eyes and think, is that memory in my head? Do I have a strong memory or do I need that physical attachment? I'm looking around my home right now and I can see things to me that are sentimental, right? But I put them on display and use them in my home. They're not stuffed in a cabinet. So if you have sentimental items and they really mean something, frame it, use it, put it to use. I mean, we live once, right? It doesn't need to sit in the cabinet protected, put it out. So Janelle, you're actually an author, which is amazing. Your book is called The Folding Book. And going through it, I realized that I really don't know how to fold the right way. So if you could indulge me, how do we fold the proper way? So I'm going to start by saying there's no right way to fold, okay, right? Good. Whatever right way is whatever you're going to actually do. You want to set goals and then be able to accomplish them, not reach for something that's not realistic to your life. But the proper way <laughs> is always to file fold. So basically what that means is that when you fold your clothes, rather than putting one on top of the other, uh -huh. you put them in like a file cabinet. So think of like you're looking through your file cabinet for papers. It's like that, but with your clothes. So you can very easily see what you have. You see your whole inventory and nothing's getting lost at the bottom. So everything has an equal opportunity to be worn. Okay, I got a lot of work ahead of me. All right, let's dive in to these products that you brought here. I'm really excited about this. I wanna get started with the tissue box cover. This is great for a high traffic area. A tissue box holder is actually a very uh, underrated way to really level up your space. And adding a cover just makes it so seamless and such an easy, simple way to make a useful item also pretty. Yeah, it is very pretty. Now let's move on to the Lazy Susan, which is great for storing your condiments. Um, you can you use it in multiple places in your home or your apartment, right? Oh yes, the Lazy Susan is my ultimate organizing product. It makes everything super visible. Now this is a big one, which is great if you have a deep cabinet. You have a big pantry and there's all this stuff in the back that you can't see. The Lazy Susan makes it so everything is visible. It's also great underneath your um, bathroom sink or your kitchen sink. You can put cleaning products on, nothing gets lost in the back. It's truly the greatest <laughs> organizing product. It really is, and Lazy Susan needs a, a rebrand. She's hard working, Susan, because this is so great. All the different ways you can use it. Let's move on to the lid organizer. Let's talk about the different places that you can use it. You can use it in your cabinets or your countertops as well, right? Definitely. Everybody always says, what do I do with my lids, my pots and pans? It's always so stressful. The lid organizer is the perfect way. If you have a drawer that you keep them in, you can always stick this in the drawer. Sometimes the bigger ones don't fit, so you can lay those flat and then put all the small ones lined up. See what sizes you have. Make sure everything matches up. Um, but you also can put it sideways in a cabinet, and then you'll see all of the lids lined up. Or you can put pans in there, too. Oh, you can fit the pans in there so everything is nice and all together. 
<gasps> I Actually, love you can put that. the pans in there. You can put sheet pans in there. Mm -hmm. You name it. Great. I love it. Let's move on to the cable organizer. So I uh, love the way that this looks. It's just so aesthetically pleasing. Can I still charge my devices even though they're in the cable organizer? 100%. So basically what that box does is it hides the power strip. So it hides where you're putting all of the cables and everything. So let's say you're putting your iPhone charger in there and you want to be able to sit your phone right on top or it be the perfect length to your bed or your couch. All you have to do is just wrap the cords the length you need, stick the cord, the ugly part, inside the box, put the lid on, and the cord just funnels out the side. It's great. It, it really makes it not an eyesore. It really does. And look, the opening here is on both sides. Ah! Yep. Okay. I'm obsessed. Let's move on to the next item here. We have this four pack. These frames are so beautiful. I'm thinking about putting these in my entryway, but then I think about putting them in my bedroom. I don't know where to start. Oh, you can put them anywhere. I think a lot of people get scared to make a place home. It's if you have a rental, like use some command strips, do anything, put pictures on the wall of your family, of your friends, of the people you love, of your pet. Um, of whatever. I have um, a gallery wall in my dining room um, with pictures of my family and everything. And it just it's like you walk in and it it's clearly my home, right? And it feels special and it makes the place have that, like you're grounded, you're grounded in your space. And that's a really important feeling to have. These are so cute because they're all yeah. the same. So it really makes it impossible to mess up. You can do a grid. Or oh, you could do one yeah, in each you room too, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I like to put them all black and white because then all the pictures blend together. It's almost like artwork. Oh, it is. And a beautiful way yeah. to introduce artwork into your home. Okay. And this I love right here because this is an under the sink organizer. Are these adjustable? Because I feel like you can put in items of different heights on here, right? Exactly. I think that the great thing about these is that under the bathroom sink or under the kitchen sink, you could use them as well. Um, we don't use vertical space, right? You put things on the, on the bottom of underneath the sink and you're like, Look at all of this dead space. Right. I mean, I feel like I can fit so much more. This makes it so that you can level up your space um, and really fit a lot more. So it's great because you can fit hair products on there, big hair sprays, and then you can do smaller skincare on top. Um, you can even put little boxes on the top to divide smaller items. If you want to put your hair ties on there, it's, it's really, really a great way to maximize that space. Right? I love items like this because you can use it anywhere. And Janelle, you have one more for us. This is where you can store yeah. your water bottles? Yes, okay, it's a me. wine rack, but it's uh, it shouldn't be limited. It's so great. You can put it in your cabinet or wherever. You can easily slide your water bottles on and off. It's incredible. So instead of having to put all of your water bottles on the shelf like mm -hmm. this, and then they all fall over and you can't find the one you need with the lid you want, there, now you're using the space. You can see everything you have, slide it in, slide it out. Super easy, game oh, changer too. It really is, and such a great housewarming gift as well. Janelle, yeah, this was amazing. <laughs> I feel like you've given me a lot of homework, so I'm thankful for that. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. This was super fun. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you, Janelle. All right, now let's run through all the products one more time the tissue box cover, the Lazy Susan turntable, the storage lid organizer, the cable organizer box, the under the sink organizers, the multi-purpose wall frames, and the bottle rack. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, founder of PSI Made This, Erica Domasek is here to share simple DIY projects to spruce up your space. Don't go away.
and lifestyle expert and founder of PSI Made This, Eric Adamasek. After a super summer, it's officially fall, which means it's time to refresh and revamp your home for the new season. Now, making big changes can get expensive, so today we have some projects that you can do right at home for just a fraction of the cost. And don't worry, we promise anyone can do them. From unique artwork that kids can really get into to the easiest fall floral arrangements, we've got you covered. We have all the products you need for the project along with very simple steps to make this happen. And remember, see the QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. So let's get to it. Let's kick it off with a simple project that can make a big impact. It's no secret that florals can spruce up any room and there's so many trendy ways to bring color and texture into the home. So for me, what I love to do during the fall is get bunches of faux flowers and make arrangements. When you walk into the house, you wanna feel the autumn season and this is the best way to do it. It's really inexpensive and the best part is you probably have everything at home, you just need some faux materials. Now, these are just flowers. These are a mix between things like dried pompous, which you've probably seen before. These things are called bunny tails. We even have some dried eucalyptus. I know this sounds confusing. All you have to do is get the bunches. They're already pre-selected and designed for you. The hardest thing you're gonna have to do is try to figure out what vase to use. Now, I'm gonna take some here and I'm gonna take a look at my height. As you can see here, that can totally work, but I might trim it a little bit. Now, these are great scissors. These are by Fiskars, but if you have floral scissors at home, those work too. And I just start to throw them in a vase and spread them around. Now, as you put them in, you wanna fluff them up a little bit. It's the simplest way to spruce up any corner of a house. And the best part is, it will last for a very long time. Now. I'm even gonna strip off some of the bottom, snip the bottoms, and again, just continue to decorate. It looks so cute. This is great for a powder room. You can use a smaller vase, or if you have a really pretty entryway with a big table, you can make it taller. You can really get creative. Look how cute this looks. Now, don't forget, you don't have to use all the bunches in one vase. You can spread it out into smaller ones, just like we did here. Super cute. Now, let's talk gallery walls. They're a gorgeous way to showcase art and photos, but after a while, you might be looking for a way to change it up. Well, I have a project for you, and it's fun for the whole family, and it will also add an instant refresh to your walls. Now, this isn't just any ordinary frame. This is one of my favorite type of frames. It's a perfect way to display artwork. It opens up, kind of like a book, and you can slide your artwork right in there. Now, the fun twist for fall is what we like to do in my house, we take leaves we collect from around the neighborhood and simply put them under some drawing paper, get our crayons, remove the wrappers, quick tip, dip them in a little bit of warm water and the paper comes right off and you're simply gonna rub over your leaf to get a beautiful textured leaf print like this. I like to layer them so it's really fun and especially for fall, you can incorporate new colors into your gallery wall. It's super chic. And guess what? You can keep changing them out. That's why these frames are so awesome. Personally, for me, the oak is what I keep in my house because it's a lighter vibe, but depends on your style and your home. There's white, there's black, whatever works, there's something there for you. Have a stain on your table runner or tablecloth? We have a solution for you that will give it an instant upgrade. Now, this is not your typical project. This is not tie-dye. You are looking at an ice dye runner that is so fun and it only takes a few minutes. But just be warned, it might get messy. So I have gloves that everybody will need. Now, the ingredients you need for this, aside for some protective gloves, are a table runner or a tablecloth. You're gonna need some dye. This right here is just a cookie rack that I had and an aluminum tray. Last but not least, you're gonna need the ice. Now, here's how to do this. First step, you're gonna take your runner. This is just plain white. Keep in mind, cotton looks best. It doesn't matter what you're dyeing, just make sure it's a cotton material. That way, it'll absorb the dye perfectly. Now, your first step is you wanna take your runner and you wanna submerge it into water. Now, I've already gone ahead to get it nice and wet here. And as you can see, it's already been rinsed out a little bit. So it's damp, it's wet, but it's not dripping. You wanna take your cloth, put it directly onto the wire rack. 
Now I'm scrunching it, which will end up giving the dye a really cool effect, which is perfect. Next up, it's the ice. Now you wanna make sure you have crushed ice. It doesn't have to be that fine, but you don't want big chunks. And you're simply gonna take big scoops and place the ice right on top of the cloth material, like I'm doing here. Now you want everything to be covered in ice. Once the top is completely covered, now you get to sprinkle dye all over it. My tip for you is don't go crazy. It's gonna spread. I know it doesn't look like that, but take a look. We're gonna start with colors that I personally love. These are jewel tones. I think it's great for fall, but really do whatever colors speak to you. And you're simply gonna sprinkle directly onto the ice. Yes, I'm telling you this is gonna work. And you're gonna sprinkle around in sections. Now keep in mind, you don't wanna over sprinkle because it will spread. And you're gonna use different colors to sprinkle on top of the ice. Give them a little room because you don't want your dyes to bleed too much. A little bit is great. Just kind of like when you tie dye, it's fun to see colors overlap, but you don't want it to look too muddy. And the whole style of this is really this broken dye look that looks so organic and fun. Keep in mind using warm colors, cool colors, anything works. Pop of color is always a really cute to do. It's gonna add a little bit of yellow in here. Now once the ice starts to melt, it's gonna all melt directly into our aluminum basin. If you don't have an aluminum basin, which honestly you can pick up at maybe a dollar store, you probably have a cookie tray or something in the house that you can use. I like to use what I have at home. This is another project that's a great way to repurpose something you have at home to bring new life into it. And your guests will be so shocked when they come over and they actually comment on your runner and you get to tell them, yes, I made this. Now, depending on how much ice you have and how large your surface is, it will take different times. It might take a couple hours. You can even leave it overnight. Another pro tip I have for you, use a hairdryer to help your ice start to melt. This will speed up the process and you'll also be able to see the melting of the dye happen right before your eyes. Now, when all the ice melts through, you're ready for the full reveal. Keep in mind, it's gonna be a little damp, so don't take it out unless it's over a tub or a sink. You don't want it to drip anywhere. Let your runner dry completely. I suggest leaving it overnight somewhere. You can hang it on a hanger or a surface that is covered so it doesn't stain anything. And it will come out looking so gorgeous. I love the one that we made here. It's so perfect for fall and I can use it season after season. I hope you guys love it. I can't wait to see when you make one. Let's take a look again at everything we made today. We've got the floral arrangements, the leaf artwork, and the DIY table runner. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's a wrap. It's been so fun showing you all of our favorites. Tune in next week for another episode of Shop All Day. Hello, Today All Day. Up next on Hashtag Cooking, Samadata making two protein-packed recipes with a pantry staple, canned chickpeas. First, she's going to use the chickpeas to make a hearty dinner with a chana masala and roasted sweet potatoes. For dessert, she's going to turn the legume into ooey-gooey chocolatey brownies. We promise you won't even taste the chickpeas. Just get out your aggression on these sweet potatoes, okay? If you have any stress in your life, don't take it out on your friends. Make this recipe. Take it out on these potatoes. My life would not run without chickpeas. Whether in savory recipes or sweet, chickpeas are truly the legume loves of my life. I guess you could really say I'm a hashtag chickpea chick. I'm gonna show you two of my favorite recipes to use chickpeas, my chana masala stuffed sweet potatoes, and a delicious and surprising chickpea brownie. I know, once you make these recipes, you're gonna love chickpeas as much as I do. 
Chana masala, sometimes called chole, is a spiced chickpea curry that my mom used to make for me all the time when I was growing up. It's one of my favorite Indian vegetarian dishes, so today I thought I'd get a little creative and stuff the chana masala inside some baked sweet potatoes. So if baked potatoes are your vibe and spiced chickpeas are your vibe, then this is the recipe for you. I've got all of my cute sweet potatoes here. They're clean, so I'm just gonna poke them with a fork so they can release steam when they bake. Don't mistake your hand for a potato, okay? Promise me you won't do that. Keep your eyes on your goal. <laughs> all right, I definitely did some damage here. Now I'm just gonna rub these potatoes with some olive oil and then sprinkle with some salt. These potatoes are at the spa currently. They're loving their lives. They're about to go into the sauna. <laughs> I only find myself funny. The olive oil is gonna allow the sweet potatoes to get nice and crisp on the outside. I love eating the skin too, it's really yummy. Now, just a little sprinkle of salt. We can't forget to season everything. We need flavor everywhere. My cutie little potatoes are ready. They're going in the oven 40 to 45 minutes at 425 degrees. Now that my sweet potatoes are safely in the oven, they're secure in there, I am gonna start on my chana masala. First thing I'm gonna do is dice my onions. Just clearing my workspace, nothing to see here. I love using onions in basically everything, but onions, garlic, and ginger are just key aromatics in Indian cooking. You really can't have Indian cooking without them. Now for my garlic, just gonna mince it. A mince is really, really fine, so you just wanna get all of that delicious garlicky flavor out. You know you did this right if you smell like garlic for three days. We're just getting at all of that flavor. Now I'm just gonna use some ginger. A really easy way to peel ginger is to use a spoon. You can just use it to scrape back that little peel, like so. See how easy that is? Super easy. And I'm using only an inch here. Now I'm just gonna mince my ginger up super fine. You wanna extract all that flavor, just so it matches the garlic too. Okay, my onions, my garlic, my ginger, we're all ready, ready for the hot oil. So now I'm just gonna heat some oil in my medium pot until it shimmers, and then I'll add all of my aromatics. Heating up my olive oil in my pot. Once the oil shimmers, then I know it's ready for the onions. Taking a little peek, the olive oil is shimmering, so it's time to add my onions. I want to cook these onions in the olive oil until they're tender, translucent, and starting to brown around the edges. I wanna get some color on them before I add the ginger and the garlic. And the reason that we're not adding the garlic and the ginger in with the onions is because those take a lot less time to cook. So we wanna get the onions going and then we'll add the ginger and garlic so those two don't burn. I think these onions are ready to meet their garlic and ginger companions. Garlic. Ginger. That smell. Mmm. You want to cook the garlic and ginger in with the onions for about one to two minutes until it smells aromatic and fragrant. Get rid of that raw smell. This is my masala box, my masala dabba, my prized possession. I have literally never lived a single day in my kitchen without it. It's how I store all of my favorite spices. It's also how my mom taught me to store all of my spices. Let me show you a little reveal. Look at that. These are all my favorite spices that I use. And these are also the ones that are gonna go in my chana masala. My onions, garlic, and ginger smell amazing. They look amazing, which means it's time for my masala. I'm going to add some of my favorite masala spices here. 
I like to add cayenne for some heat, for some spice. Adding turmeric, one of my favorite spices. A lot of cumin, I absolutely love it. Time for some coriander powder. Adding that straight in. Did you know that coriander powder is just the seeds of cilantro ground up? Now you know. Now I'm just gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper. So I want to roast my masala spices until that raw masala smell goes away. We want to toast it, we want it to smell fragrant and aromatic. And finally, my little secret ingredient, umchur powder, or dry mango powder. Umchur powder is so tangy, it's tart, it adds a little something extra into this chana masala. Adding umchur powder was definitely my mom's tip, so thank you, mom, for making my chana masala a lot better than it was before. I wish you could smell it, but you can't. So you're just gonna have to make it. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't make the rolls, but I am making them a little bit here. Okay, my masala smells amazing, smells super aromatic. Now I'm gonna add my tomato paste. Right here. I wanna cook the tomato paste in with my onions and spices until it deepens in color. Now I'm gonna add my tomatoes. You can use fresh tomatoes for sure, but I'm using canned and crushed tomatoes because I think convenience is the most gorgeous thing. My tomatoes are looking delicious. Delish. Now I'm gonna add my vegetable broth. Okay, I've brought everything to a boil. Now I'm just gonna reduce to a simmer and cook uncovered for five minutes. We have to add a very important friend to the party. Our chickpeas. I could never forget about them. How could you think that? Adding them straight in here. Get them really up in that gravy. Now that the chickpeas have found a really nice home in here, I just wanna simmer this together for 20 minutes. I want the gravy to become thick and the chickpeas to really infuse in with all of that masala. Make sure you cover this while it simmers. Okay, 20 minutes has passed. I think it's time we take a peek at my chana masala. I mean, look at that, look how thick it is. It looks delicious, it smells even better. 
There is one more thing that I do like to add in my chana masala. It's just a little sneaky spinach. Nothing to see here, just some sneaky spinach. You won't even see it or taste it. I just like to sneak in some cute greens in there from time to time, you know? Just adding a handful. I'm just gonna tear it, roughly. No science to that here. And I'm gonna stir it into my chana masala until it wilts. Speaking of something green, I do like to add a little bit of cilantro in here as well. Something zesty, herby, brings all of the flavors to light. I keep those tender stems, but I'll remove the thick stems like this. This doesn't have to be added to our chana masala. All this talk about cilantro has me craving something, my cilantro mint chutney. I'm gonna show you how to make that. I'm just gonna let this hang out while I do that. Let me just start off by saying that I love chutney. A life without chutney is one that I just don't wanna live. If you're not eating chutney, you are not living. Chutney is super popular in Indian food, especially Indian street food. I find that it's zesty, it's bright. It's usually with a lot of herbs, a lot of spices, a lot of lemon or something acidic. It's super delicious and really tangy. Let's make my favorite cilantro mint chutney. This, by the way, is so easy to make. You're just gonna throw everything in your blender. I'm just gonna get my cilantro ready. Again, just like in my chana masala, where it's okay to keep those tender stems on the cilantro, I'm just gonna keep the tender ones, but remove the thicker ones. These are a bit more bitter, so we don't want these in our chutney. Like I said, super simple recipe. You can add everything to our blender. I don't know why these specials are in here. They wanted their 15 seconds of fame. <laughs> Remove them. I'm gonna add my cilantro straight into my blender. Like that. Mint is super floral. It's very bright. So I find that it complements the cilantro really well. And anything you add this in is just gonna really awaken the flavors. If the flavors were sleeping, this chutney is gonna awaken the flavors. I love some heat, I love some spice. So we're gonna be adding a full green chili here. If you want it to be less spicy, you can de-seed it. But I will not be partaking in that. I want all the spice. I'm just gonna trim it, pop it straight in there. Yes, I live life a little risky, how I do. Just juicing a fresh lemon in. Nothing like some fresh lemon juice. It's gonna really brighten all of those flavors up. Add something a bit acidic, which we need with all of those zesty herbs. Now for my spices, I'm gonna add some salt and a little cumin. My precious box. Little cumin. And some salt. Now I'm just gonna add a little bit of water to help get the blender going. You can feel free to add more water as you blend just if you need to get the blender moving a bit more. Texture looks great. Oh, it smells so good too. With that, as you can see, some nice texture. I wanted this to be a little thinner because I will be drizzling it on top of my chana masala stuffed sweet potatoes. I'm gonna set this aside, go check on my potatoes, and then I'm gonna get ready to plate.
I mean, it is literally oozing sweetness. Look at that caramelization. Okay, so I have to tell you something. Chana masala is typically served with roti, naan, or rice, but I wanted to get a little fun here, a little creative, so I'm gonna stuff my chana masala into my sweet potatoes. I know. Take it down now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to plate. I think I'm ready to eat. That I know for sure. I am gonna get this potato right here. That is the one that I want. This is the chosen one. Look at all of that sugar that's just caramelized around the edges. <gasps> okay, you need to look at this. Do you see this? Do you see it? Okay, onto my plate we go. I love a sweet potato. Love, literally love. Time to bring my chana masala into the picture. I'm gonna move these guys aside. I will see you later. Time for you. Does everyone talk to their food like I do? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. I'm gonna cut my sweet potato. Just create a little slit right here. Just a little home for that chana masala to sit in. Mm. Perfect. Now it's time for my chana masala. Oh, that smells so good. I'm gonna get a little bit of everything, that thick gravy, the chickpeas, my sneaky spinach. Straight inside. It fits perfectly little home for my chana masala. Great. Okay. Now, did not forget about my cilantro chutney. This is gonna add some brightness, some freshness, and a little bit of spice. Now, just for a little bit of glam, we're gonna add some chopped, or I should say, torn cilantro. A little on the plate, just to, you know, aesthetics. I can assure you that my mom has never done this before, so I have to show her a picture. I wanna see what she's gonna think. She will be proud of this chana masala, though, because that looks pretty good. Mom, I hope you're proud. That looks so pretty. Aesthetically speaking, this looks amazing. Can I eat this now? I think yes, I think yes, I can eat this now. I mean, this literally can do no wrong. It's hearty, it's satisfying, it's filling. It's very balanced. I think I really leveled up baked potatoes today. Perfect weeknight dinner, even lunch. That caramelization on that sweet potato is just getting me. I just can't even handle it. it looks so good. We all think of chickpeas in something like a chana masala, right? But here's the secret. I really like to bake with them in my desserts. I know, I know you're questioning my life choices right now, but just you wait. I'm gonna go get the ingredients for my chickpea brownies.
These chickpea brownies are one of the most popular recipes on my blog. And because I know you're wondering, I know you're asking the question, can you taste the chickpeas? All I have to say to you is no. All they do is simply create an irresistible fudgy texture. And with chocolate involved, everyone wins. So let's get to it. First thing I'm gonna add in here is some almond butter. I like this because it's kind of rich, it's nutty. It adds a lot to these brownies. Now we're gonna add my chickpeas, my most valuable pantry player, my MVPP, my chickpeas. Make sure before you add these chickpeas into your blender, you rinse them super, super well. And just remember, the chickpeas don't add any flavor to these brownies. All they do is help to create a really nice fudgy texture and make it really satiating when you eat it. Now I'm gonna go for some vanilla extract. Delish. To sweeten these chickpea brownies up, I'm gonna use some coconut sugar. Beautiful. Now, for my flour in these brownies, I'm not actually using a bunch of it at all. I'm gonna use some almond flour. It's kind of dense, it's delicious. It's also gonna help create a nice and fudgy brownie. What I like about almond flour is that it's just almonds, right? So that creates some really good texture and also a really nice nutty finish. Okay, we've gotta have a little bit of cocoa powder. I'm using unsweetened cocoa powder here. This is really important. We don't want anything added to our cocoa powder. We want it to be pure. And we're already adding sugar to our brownie, so no need to buy a sweetened cocoa powder. To help everything blend, I'm gonna add some almond milk now and a little bit later too. Are you ready for the blender brownies of your dreams? Are you ready to not make a smoothie and make brownies instead? Same. Okay, here we go. Perfection, perfection. I'm gonna scrape the sides down, give it another little blend. You want it to be super, super smooth. You literally never know there are chickpeas in here. It's actually kind of scary. Okay, you gotta look at this texture. You just, you gotta look at this texture. Come on now, that's just not fair. Super velvety, really smooth. Just needs one thing, chocolate chips. Cause it's me. And why would I make a brownie without chocolate chips? It just doesn't seem right. Make sure you remove this from the blender before you add your chocolate chips so you don't blend up some chocolate chips into the air. No, that is not speaking from personal experience. I'm gonna fold in my chocolate chips. I do not measure this with anything but my heart and my soul. Now it's time to transfer into my pan. I gotta get a shot of this. The texture is luscious. <gasps> I know, there's chickpeas in here, isn't that crazy? You really could fool a lot of people. I'm not saying do that, I'm not saying trick people, but like, I'm just saying you could. Have you ever wondered what the difference is between a chickpea and a garbanzo bean? Well, I have news for you. There is no difference. They're the same thing. Garbanzo is just the Spanish term for a chickpea. This just looks nice, honestly, plus a little extra chocolate never hurt anyone. I gave up. Okay, we are ready for the oven. Going in 350 degrees for 35 to 40 minutes, and I am so excited for their journey. My pride and joy, my chickpea brownies. I've let them cool for 25 minutes. This is important because it lets them firm up, and when they come out of the oven, you know that they're done when they start to pull away from the sides of the pan. Look at how easy parchment paper makes my life. 
All right. I mean, look at how fudgy that is. Delish. All that has to happen, it's time for me to eat it. Okay, I think I'm ready to taste. Oh, it's so fudgy. Mmm. This is my party trick, putting chickpeas into brownies. I just need to take a picture of that interior, that fudgy bit. Mm. It's too good. It is crazy how you can't taste the chickpeas. They just add to that really nice fudgy texture. They've got some rich chocolate, so they taste super decadent, but they're also super satiating. And so fudgy, melt in your mouth. The extra chocolate chips. Nobody's mad about that. I'm not mad about it. I hope this inspired you to use chickpeas in new and fun, unique ways, even baking them into brownies. Now you know why they're so versatile and also why they're the legume love of my life. Hi, everybody. Good Thursday morning. More people, including Americans, fleeing Gaza this morning. As President Biden takes